Okay, so welcome everyone to the 76th lecture of Dr. Hydri Step 1. Um, before we begin, can we ask whether you guys can hear my voice? If you guys can, can I get a yes in the chat box? Okay, thank you. So I uh, hope you guys had a great day today. Uh, we apologize for starting the lecture a little bit later. Uh, we had to do that because of some unavoidable circumstances. But we hope it will not hamper our um, schedule for today. Our schedule is to finish the antimicrobials. And we would like to finish it as much as possible by today so that from tomorrow we can we can begin pathology. And um, hopefully by the end of next week, we would be done wrapping up our first batch of uh, the first aid students. So um, before we begin, can we ask that whether you guys did your homeworks yesterday or not? Uh, I, I would. I would really expect some rapid answers, either a yes or a no. If you did the homework or if you did not do the homework, that's all I want to know. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to test you guys today since we have very little time. Okay. Homework and questions, homework and questions. Which one did you guys do and how were they? How many questions did you guys do? If you guys did questions and how much of the homeworks did you guys do yesterday? That's all I wanna know. 30 questions, okay, good. So out of 30 questions, how many did you guys get right? Or how many did you get right? Seventy-five percent, that's remarkable, thank you. That's very good. Anyone else? I would really appreciate you guys telling me if you guys did the homework or you did not do the homework, whether it's a yes or it's a no, or if you guys did questions, and if you guys did questions, how many questions did you guys do? And how were your answers? How many correct answers did you give? No problem, thank you for answering. Next next student, NBME. Okay, Dr. Masam, you did NBME, that's very good. How was your score? What did you get? If you want, you can send me a private message, no problem. I will not reveal your score. If you don't want to tell me your score, just let me know if you if it was okay or not. 212, that's very good. You have not even entered your dedicated period and it's already 212. So that is extremely remarkable. Very good. Dr. Adenom, uh, Amboss 60, 93%, very good. So you did 60 questions from emboss from uh, microbiology and you got 93 percent in emboss questions wow okay that's very good that is very good uh i personally feel like that is more of your um knowledge and achievement so thank you so much for um putting your um work into this whole thing and uh, trying to achieve this goal really proud of you guys anyone else with some any good news or any news homework questions what you guys do okay were, were, were you guys able to revise the microbiology which we discussed yesterday that's the last question before i begin So <clears throat> without uh, further ado, let's not waste any more time. Let's get into the lecture. Um, <clears throat> Doctor, do you think the mark can rise more 30 to 40 after dedicated period? Yes, of course, because dedicated periods are made to increase your marks. Okay, the fact that you are scoring 212 right away right now, before you have entered your dedicated period, that's absolutely amazing. So keep up the good work and have trust in yourself. Okay, very good. Okay, so since you guys um, did the homework, which I asked you guys to do, and um, okay, first and foremost, last question, the 
microbiology lectures, which we took yesterday, just a feedback from you guys. Were they helpful for you all or were they not helpful? Or did, or did you guys have to study way more than expected? Because we are done with microbiology as of right now, we are studying antimicrobials. If you guys have not realized this, we have we are already done with microbiology. We're done with bacteria, virus, fungi, parasites, everything. All we have to do is just learn the drugs right now, but that falls widely under pharmacology, not microbiology. But the microbiology lectures, were they helpful or not helpful? That's all I wanna know. Okay. Everyone else, can I get some feedback? Either it's a yes or either it's a no, so that, that way we can improve ourselves. Okay, so thank you for your response. Uh, are we ready to begin the lecture for today? Yes or no? Everyone, are we ready to begin the lecture for today? Okay, so let's begin the lecture for today. First and foremost, I just wanna see where we stand, okay? Over here, if it's um, over, over here, if it's a DNA, uh, if, it's a, if it's a bacteria, my apologies, okay? Over here, if it's a bacteria, now, okay. Now, what are the drugs that's working over here? Peptidoglycan cross-linking, fast answers, please. Peptidoglycan cross-linking preventing bacteria. What are the bacteria that's working over here? Penicillins and cephalosporins. Very good. Okay, so let's talk about these bacteria first. Okay, let's talk, let's let's talk about these antimicrobials first, not bacteria. My apologies. Let's talk about these antimicrobials first. The antimicrobials that's working over there are your cell wall peptidoglycan cross-linking preventers. And over there, you have two groups of antibiotics. First of them are penicillins, and other ones are cephalosporins, okay? Penicillins are basically, there are penicillinase-sensitive penicillins, and then there are penicillinase-resistant penicillins. Now, if I have to ask you about penicillinase, penicillinase is an enzyme that is responsible for the breakdown of penicillins. So if you guys remember the structure of the bacteria, which we talked about, do you guys have any idea where this penicillinase could be located? Fast answer, please. Either it's a yes or a no, so that I can tell you the answer. Penicillinase, where do you think this penicillinase could be located? Very good, periplasmic space, periplasmic space. But is it, so is it more in gram positives or gram negatives? Gram negative, very good. So penicillinase sensitive penicillins, okay, meaning that these um, uh, these are these are very sensitive to penicillinase, meaning that in the presence of penicillinase, this penicillins will not be able to exert their maximum actions. So these are penicillin G, penicillin V, ampicillin, and amoxicillin. So let's talk about penicillin G and penicillin V. Always remember penicillin G and V, whenever you have these wide group letters attached to penicillin, that means they're long acting. That means they're basically, they're long acting penicillin. So penicillin G is there in IV and IM, okay? And penicillin V is for oral, okay? Now, the, the way that you guys can remember this is, okay, G for, G4, gangster, okay, G4, G4, gangster, meaning that <clears throat> gangsters, are they hardcore or, or, or are they not hardcore? Fast answers, please. Hardcore or not hardcore? They, they are hardcore. Gangsters, who, would they mind uh, getting an, uh, would they mind <clears throat> getting an injection? 
hardcore people, would they mind getting an injection or not? No, okay. So penicillin G is for penicillin gangster, meaning that penicillin G is more hardcore. They would not mind receiving intravenous or intramuscular, okay? So they would not mind receiving injections. Penicillin Vs, on the other hand, they are not very hardcore, okay? They would rather prefer oral method, meaning that they would rather prefer the medication be ingested rather than injected, okay? So penicillin V is oral. This is a prototype beta-lactam antibiotics. The mechanism over here is that um, in the peptidoglycan, you have D-alanine, D-alanine structure analog. So D-ala, D-ala structure analog. So for example, if this is um, the peptidoglycan cross linkage, okay? Over here, you have D-alanine, 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 and that's a type of structure analog that is responsible uh, for maintaining the structure of the peptidoglycan. So the penicillin G, uh, G or the penicillin V will bind to the penicillin binding proteins, okay? And this penicillin binding proteins will block the transpeptidase. Now, transpeptidase is, transpeptidase is responsible for forming the cross link in between one alanine and another alanine. So one peptide with another peptide will try to form a cross link. And, that is done under the presence of this enzyme called transpeptidase. And penicillin will go and attack transpeptidase and prevent the cross-linking of the of the peptidoglycan. As a result, <clears throat> this will go and attack the cell wall, and the cell walls will have low peptidoglycans, and it will be, it will have a lower, uh, it, it will have a softer outer structure. This will activate the autolytic enzyme, then as a result, they will go and kill the bacteria. Clinical use for penicillin. Okay, <clears throat> before we go for the clinical use, are we clear about this penicillin G and penicillin B? Are we clear about the mechanism of action? Right? The only thing that you have to focus on over here are two words. So please write this down. Okay, just focus on two words because that these are the only two things that um, you get the questions from. Okay, so D ala or D alanine, that's one word for penicillin G and penicillin B. Another word, another word is transpeptidase. Another word is transpeptidase. So these are the two words, transpeptidase. The clinical use is they're mostly used for gram-positive organisms, okay? They're mostly used for gram-positive gram organisms. Why can they not be used for gram-negative or, or, or organisms mainly or mostly? Fast answers, please. Penicillinase, very, very good, less peptidoglycan. And also gram negatives, they have a tendency of having more penicillinase in the periplasmic space. So they're mostly used for gram positive organisms. And they're also used for gram negative cocci, mainly Nigeria meningitis and Spirochetis family, mainly Triponema pallidum. This is very high yield. Bactericidal for gram positive. Bactericidal. Bactericidal, this word, does this mean stopping the growth of bacteria or does it mean killing the bacteria? Bactericidal. Fast answers, please. Killing the bacteria. Very good. And another word is bacteriostatic. Okay, well, bacteriostatic is preventing the growth of bacteria. So bactericidal for gram positive cocci, gram positive rods, gram negative cocci, and spirochets, and beta lactam sensitive. Now, you do not have to focus on all of this, okay? You do not have to focus on a lot of these things, so don't worry about this, okay? So the number one thing that you have to understand over here is the mechanism, okay? The clinical use is not high yield. You do not have to specifically know that it's for this and that. They will tell you where they are using it so that this is not something which you have to focus on. Don't worry. This is what you have to focus on, adverse effects. Adverse effects, okay. Hypersensitivity reactions, meaning that a lot of people, they are very sensitive to penicillins. The thing is penicillins, they have, this, they have the tendency of acting as haptins. And what type of reactions can they cause? Fast answers, please. Do you guys remember serum sickness? Yes or no? Serum sickness, right? Okay, 
So in serum sickness, what happens is they have a they have a mounting of, of an immune response against uh, haptins and penicillins. They have a tendency of acting as a haptins and they can mount an immune response. So that's a hypersensitivity reactions. That's number one. If you guys want, you guys are more than welcome to write serum sickness over here. Then they can cause Coombs positive hemolytic anemia, meaning that <clears throat> Over there, they can act as um, they over there. If you do the Coombs reaction, it will be a positive reaction. So it's a Coombs positive hemolytic anemia. Another one is drug induced interstitial nephritis. Drug induced interstitial nephritis. Now, now, this is my advice to you all for adverse effects. Okay, either you can learn the adverse effects associated with the drugs right now. Okay. Either you can learn the adverse effects associated with the drugs right now, or when you guys read pharmacology over there, there's a great, uh, there's a small section of adverse effects, different types of adverse effects or different types of drugs, or you guys can focus on that one too. <clears throat> okay, so either one. Um, I personally feel like you can do both. For example, you can read all the adverse effects from all the drugs right away. And then later, when you guys read pharmacology, you, can, you guys can do a revision of the adverse effects. So that's that. So um, penicillin G, penicillin V, so that these are the these are the adverse effects. First of all, hypersensitivity, diet school positive hemolytic anemia and drug induced interstitial nephritis. Okay. Resistance. Now, this is this is what we will do. Okay. What I need you guys to do is, if you guys, uh, if if you guys have, um, if you guys have an empty page or a notebook where you guys are taking the notes, okay, I need you guys to make this table so that it's important for you for a faster revision because. A lot of students will remember the mechanisms of actions. A lot of students will remember the adverse effects, but a very handful of students will only remember the resistance of the drugs, meaning that mechanism of how this drug can become resistant. So what I need you guys to do is, I need you guys to write drugs, okay? I need you guys to write drugs over here, and I need you guys to write resistance over here, mechanism of resistance. And this piece of notes, which you will make right now, I need you guys to keep this very close to you, post it on your wall or keep it on your notebook so that you guys have the time to revise this very frequently. The reason being is this, that remembering this mechanism of resistance of the drugs will be the difference in your scores from 220s to 230s. So the, that's that, okay? So the first drug which you have just learned is penicillin G and penicillin B. The mechanism of resistance is that if there's a mutation in penicillin binding proteins. So the penicillins, they have, the, they have to go and bind to the PBPs and then deactivate transpeptidase. If there's a mutation in penicillin binding protein, they cannot go and bind to the PBPs. And as a result, they cannot activate transpeptidase. And um, that's how, uh, I mean, deactivate transpeptidase and, and the cross-linking will keep on happening. So that's how they can get resistance in the body. That's number one for mutation. Another one is the presence of beta-lactamase, the presence of beta-lactamase, meaning that they are beta-lactam sensitive. So if it's a gram-negative bacteria with a lot of beta-lactamase in the periplasmic space, they will not be able to exert their action. So with that, we have we are done with penicillin G and penicillin V. Always remember, G is for gangster. Gangsters don't mind receiving intravenous IV and IM, and V is for uh, more softer core, meaning that they can, they only prefer ingestion, not injection. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Have we understood how to study the drugs? Everyone, I need some feedback. Perfect. Did you guys do the notes, which I asked you to? Okay. Um, I, I appreciate it. A lot of students uh, who uploaded the videos or pictures of uh, how they did the, of how they did um, the equations from the first aid book. 
can you guys tell can you guys please tell me who you guys are the ones who did the equations fast answers please we don't have all the just write me that will be okay okay dr Garbasi. then who else dr dahlia who else dr adenam dr hosam was also there who else okay Okay, I also saw, I also appreciated Dr. Jordan, who initially didn't want to, but then like later she did. So very good. Um, I don't think she's here with us today. Okay. 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 Um, can we give two other students the responsibility of doing the equations once again, either take a video or do a picture or take a picture of the fact that you guys did it under 15 minutes. Okay, so can we ask Dr. Fagan and can we ask Dr. Evelyn to, okay, Dr. Fagan and Dr. Evelyn, can you guys hear my voice? Are you guys with me? Okay, so, so what you guys have to do is, for, from first aid, you have the last page of equations over there. You have to learn the equations, okay, keep it in your mind. And if possible, take a video of you doing the equations under 15 minutes, or if you're not a big fan of taking a video, what you have to do is take a picture of what you did and take a picture of the timing under which you did, did the equations and you post it in the group so that you can motivate others to do the same, okay? So that's that. Now, let's move on to the next one. So we are done with penicillin G and penicillin B. The next one is penicillin A sensitive penicillins. Again, uh, penicillin G and V are also penicillin A sensitive penicillins. And then we also have amoxicillin and ampicillin. The mechanism of action is the same as penicillin, meaning that they will bind to the penicillin binding proteins, deactivate transpeptidase and prevent peptidoglycan cross-linking. The spectrum meaning at which they will act is wider. And they can also be combined with clavulunic acid to protect against destruction by beta lactamase. So clavulonic acid, I'm pretty sure you guys know a lot of the names of these drugs. These are known as amoxiclav or ampiclav, right? So clavulonic acid combination with amoxicillin will prevent the beta lactamase breakdown because these are sensitive to penicillinase. So that's that. Extended spectrum, meaning that they will cover all the gram positives that were mentioned over here. Along with this, they will also cover hemophilus, H. pylori, E. coli, Listeria, Proteus, Salmonella, and Shigella. Okay, you do not have to know this because you do not have to know whether it covers this or not covers this. Okay, all you have to know is the mechanism of action, adverse effects, and this is where the money shot is. That is the mechanism of resistance. Okay, so that's that. So the, main, the mechanism of action is the same thing as the previous one. If you have to know an extra one, okay, for some, uh, uh, always remember that instead of knowing which microorganism you can prescribe the drug for, always remember the question stem will mention the microorganism and the question stem will mention the mechanism of action at certain times too, so that they, will, they can also tell you that they are prescribing a drug which, uh, which prevents peptidoglycan cross-linking, okay? Please heed your attention to the fact that whether it's peptidoglycan cross-linking they're mentioning or whether they're saying peptidoglycan synthesis. Because if they say peptidoglycan synthesis, then which drugs are they talking about? Fast answers, please. If they're talking about peptidoglycan synthesis, prevention of peptidoglycan synthesis, they are talking about vancomycin. Very good. They're talking about glycopeptides, okay? But if they're talking about peptidoglycan cross-linking, then they're talking about penicillins and cephalosporins. Mechanism of action, once again, it's penicillinase, cleaves the beta lactam ring. So you don't have to necessarily write this whole thing again, or just write it down over here that amoxicillin and ampicillin, amoxicillin and ampicillin also fall under this criteria. Okay, next one. Next one is penicillinase resistant penicillin. Penicillinase resistant penicillins, meaning that um, uh, they do not uh, respond well to penicillinase. So if the drug, if the bacteria has penicillinase, they will not be able to deactivate these uh, drugs. So they can work under the uh, they can work under the presence of penicillinase. The names of these drugs are dicloxacillin, nafcillin, and oxacillin. Okay, the name of the names of these drugs are 
dicloxacillin, nafcillin, and oxalin. Okay. Now, the way that you can remember this, okay, is di and ox. Okay. If you guys want, you guys can write this down over here. Di and ox. Okay. So, dicloxacillin, nafcicillin, oxacillin. The mechanism of action is the same as penicillin, except the fact that they are a narrower spectrum, meaning that their spectrum of um, target of the bacteria are more narrower. Narrow spectrum, penicillin A is resistant because now this is high yield. This is where the questions are going to come. So I'm just going to use this red marker over here because the bulky R group blocks access of beta lactamase to beta lactam ring. This is extremely high yield. This is where you will get questions from, from Dianox. They will mention either the patient was uh, under dicloxacillin, nafcillin, or oxacillin and has been changed previously from amoxicillin. Now, previously, amoxicillin was not working. Now, dicloxacillin or nafcillin, they are working. The question is, what is the reason for the improvement of symptoms? The reason for the improvement of symptoms in these patients is that the new drug has a bulky group. So basically, um, these drugs, they have, if you would like to imagine, they have, for example, they have this outer covering of R groups, okay? Outer coverings of R groups. So in order for the beta lactams to go and destroy the drugs, they have to go through this group first and then go and destroy the beta lactam rings of the, of the drug. So uh, when all the beta lactams, they try to go and break down the R group, before they could go and attack the beta lactam rings of the penicillins, the penicillins exert their action and kill the bacteria. So that's that. The beautiful thing about this thing is that the adverse effects are still the same. That is hypersensitivity and interstitial nephritis. Okay, so that's that. You do not have to pay more attention to this. Mechanism of resistance is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus has altered penicillin binding protein target site, meaning that um, methicillin MRSA, okay, they, they can get uh, these drugs cannot work properly in methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus because they have altered penicillin binding protein target site. So these drugs can basically work in all types of bacteria except MRSA. So all you have to do is write down over here, dianox or dicloxacillin, nafcillin and oxalin, which, whichever you prefer, okay? They cannot work in methicillin resistant Staph aureus and short in a short manner is write down altered PBP, altered penicillin binding protein. Okay, so that's that. Now, let's talk about anti-pseudomonal penicillin, okay? Anti-pseudomonal penicillin. Do you guys remember campfire? Who remembers campfire? Who remembers campfire? What do I mean by campfire? What do I mean by campfire? Drugs for pseudomonas, very good. Carbapenem then, C4 carbapenem, A4, A4, aminoglycoside, very good, M4 monobactam, P4, P4, piperacillin, very good. And then F4, fluoroquinolones, I4, fast answers please, I4, Do you guys remember third generation cephalosporin, right? Third generation cephalosporin, Dr. Ahmed, thank you. R4, fast answers. Okay, so, okay, so campfire. We learned campfire before. So campfires are basically all the drugs, okay? Campfires are basically all the drugs that are used for pseudomonas. Over there, we have campfire. The P in campfire stands for piperacillin. 
Piperacillin is an anti-pseudomonal penicillin. Okay, so pseudomonas, okay, is it gram positive or gram negative? Fast answers, please. <clears throat> gram positive or is it gram negative? Gram negative, pseudomonas is gram negative. If it's gram negative, what shape of the bacteria is pseudomonas? What is the shape of pseudomonas? It's a rod. If it's a rod, what are those tests that we do? Lactose fermenting test, very good. Is it a fermenter or a not fermenter? It's a not fermenter. Then if, do we do an oxidase test? Okay. So over here, pseudomonas are the organisms which are very high yield for iatrogenic infections, either in the hospital setting. For diabetic patients, they are very high yield. For diabetic ketoacidosis, they are very high yield. That is, they can cause these diseases, okay? So pseudomonas, anti-pseudomonal penicillin are piperacillin and ticarcillin. They, this mechanism of action is the same as penicillin. That is, they are peptidoglycan cross-linking preventers, but the spectrum of action is extended spectrum. It is highly sensitive to penicillin A, so we have to use it with clavulonic acids or, uh, for example, beta-lactamase inhibitors. Okay? Clinical use is that they're used for pseudomonas patients, and gram-negative rods can also be used for this. So we can also use this for all the other um, uh, gram-negatives, right? For example, there's E. coli, right? Then, then we have Shigella, Salmonella, Proteas, Arsenia. So we can also prescribe these for gram negative, gram negative rods. Adverse effect wise, they, it's only hypersensitivity reaction. So this page has been relatively easy. Okay, now let's move on to this one. That is the next drug that we want to talk about that prevents peptidoglycan cross linking is cephalosporin. The mechanism of action of cephalosporin is that they are beta lactam drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis but are less susceptible to penicillinase. That is, they are also penicillinase sensitive, but if penicillinase had to attack penicillins and cephalosporins, penicillins would die first and cephalosporins will die later. That's, that's what it means. But the mechanism of action is basically the same thing. They bind to the penicillin binding proteins, act, deactivate transpeptidase, and prevent peptidoglycan cross-linking. Now, cephalosporin are there in multiple generations. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and we will learn the names of these drugs right now. Organisms which are not covered by first to fourth are lamed, okay? So these are the four organisms which are not covered from first to fourth groups of cephalosporin. And uh, this is what you have to remember, unfortunately. This is the only microbiological groups of uh, microbi microbiology bugs which you have to know for cephalosporin. That is for first and fourth generation, Listeria, atypical, such as Chlamydia and Mycoplasma, Marsa, and Enterococci. These four drugs will, uh, these four um, bugs, this, these four bacteria will not respond to cephalosporin. So, no matter which group of cephalosporin you give, Listeria, atypical, Marsa, and Enterococci, these will not um, respond to cephalosporins. Clinical use. Let's talk about the clinical use first. So we have to know about the names of the drugs. The first group is, the first group is cefazolin and cephalexin. Okay. The first group is cefazolin and cephalexin. They are gram-positive cocci, and um, they they will target gram positives. Along with this, they will target PEC. PEC is for PECK. Let's talk about these drugs over here for one second. Okay. Let's talk about these drugs over here for one second. Are you guys still with me? Can you guys hear my voice? Yes or no? Okay, just give me one second. Okay, so let's talk about these drugs over here. So the first group of drugs the first generation is first gen generation is zoline and lexine. Okay. First gen generation is zoline and le and lexine. Okay, that is the first generation. 
second generation is second generation is fake fox fur okay this is how i remember this fake fox fur fake for safe safe lor fox for cefoxidine and fur for cefuroxin there's another one called cefu uh, there's another one called cefotatan but uh, that's not very high also i personally did not try to remember that drug at all so cefaclor cefuroxin and cefoxidine so fake fuck fake fox and fur and over here you have cefazolin and cefalexine okay next one next one is next one is okay cry tax try tax okay try tax for self triaxone and c for taxine there, then there are two more other drugs which are not high yield for third generation so i did not pay more attention than these two so cefazolin cefalexine cefaclor cefoxidine cefuroxime ceftriaxone cefotaxime okay fourth generation is okay pimp pimp okay like the song from 50 cent pimp that's cefe pimp okay cefe pimp p i m e those p i m e over there but this is just a mnemonic so cefe pimp c e f e p i m e cefe pimp okay and number 5 is roll roll for cefta rolin cefta rolin okay so cefazolin cefalexine cefaclor cefoxidine cefuroxime ceftriaxone cefotaxime cefepim cefta rolin are we clear about this yes or no okay should i go back to the previous page should i go back to this page over here okay now so all of these drugs okay all of these drugs they will work for all of these drugs they will work for gram positives and gram negatives but from first to fifth generation the positivity would be more towards negative basically meaning that first generation would be more gram positive second generation would be more gram positive from third generation onwards they would be more gram negative they would be more gram negative they would more gram negative so the so the increase so the more generations of cephalosporins you increase the more gram negatives will get targeted that's what you have to realize and the more initial the more uh the more um previous generations or the beginning generation that is first and second generations these drugs will target gram positives so first generations and these are the zolins and lexins so cefazolin cefalexin gram positives along with gram positive they will also target pec organism pec for protease e coli klebsiella as simple as that and this is high yield cefazolin is used prior to surgery to prevent staph aureus wound infections this is high yield because this is a question from amboss and you were both okay I'll put your star marks over here second generations are fake fox and fur okay fake fox fur so cefaclor cefox cefoxidine cefuroxime these are gram positive cocci along with this second generations they will target gram positive protease e coli klebsiella and they will also target hens organism so hens pec positive hens pec these were only positive pec these were positive hens pec hens pec for hemophilus enterobacter nigeria and seracea hemophilus enterobacter nigeria seracea protease e coli klebsiella and all the other gram positives so that's that third generations are tri and tax so cef triaxone and cefotaxime there is cefo cefo uh, cefpog cef, cefpodoxim i cannot even like um i cannot even pronounce this one because we we have never used this 
and then we have Sefta ZD. That's all, that's that's used. I've I, I I personally have used this one. I have never used this, so that's that. But Ceph triaxone and cefotaxines are more widely used, so that's why these are more high yield. These are more serious gram-negative or gram-negative infections that are resistant to other beta-lactam. So for that, we use third-generation cephalosporin. They can cross the blood-brain barrier. That's that's a, that's that's one. And ceft over here is working towards penicillin. Uh, I mean, towards pseudomonas. ceft is working towards pseudomonas. Okay, I'm just going to put a star mark over here. But all you have to remember is third-generation cephalosporin. So even if, if it's not ceft Ceftriaxone and cefotaxims are equally capable of working against pseudomonas. So the, there's nothing really special about this. And they can cross the blood brain barrier and they are used to treat meningitis, gonor gonorrhea, and Lyme disease. So third generation cephalosporins are used to treat Lyme disease. Fourth are the PIMs. So cefepim. Cefepim is four gram negatives with increased activity against pseudomonas and gram positive organisms. Okay. Fifth is four. Over here, fifth is four. Rolling, so ceftra rolling, okay, ceftra rolling. These are gram positives and gram negative. Both coverage, both gram positives and negatives will be covered. And unlike first to fourth generation cephalosporin, ceftra rolling covers um, MARSA and Enterococcus faecalis. Okay, unlike first and fourth generation cephalosporins, ceftra rolling covers MARSA, meaning that they will cover methicillin resistant. Enterococcus, but they will not cover pseudomonas. That's what you have to remember over here. So this is the only thing is you do not have to focus on this one. Just focus on the fact that pseudomonas is covered by third generation. Okay, so that's that's all you have to know over here. Now, who is confident to name the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth groups of cephalosporin in one go? Anyone from the mnemonic which I just said? That is Zolin Lexine, Fake Fox Fur, Tri Tax, then Pimp and Roll. Who can mention the names of the drugs based on the mnemonics which I have just mentioned? Anyone? Can I get some responses from you guys, please? I would really appreciate the response. If it's a yes, it's a yes. If it's a no, it's still a response. I'd still appreciate it. Anything would do at this point, to be honest. Okay. So by yes, can I assume that you guys are confident to name the groups of the drugs, to name the drugs? Yes. Dr. Hossam, you can? Okay, good. So let's hear you name the drugs. You can unmute yourself if you want to. Uh, yes, um, you can hear me, yeah? Fast answers, please. We do not have all day. Yes, first first generation, Cifazolin and Cifalixine. Cifa, Second generation, we have uh, Cifotaxime. Can you guys hear my voice? Is there something wrong with my connection? You, can you hear me, doctor? Okay. So, Dr. Hassan, would you be kind enough to... Um, would you be kind enough to mention the drugs or is anyone confident enough to name the cephalosporin drugs? That's all I want to know, yes or no? You can't hear us. Oh, okay. oh Hosam is talking? Okay. Oh, my apologies. Okay, my apologies, Dr. Hosam. Okay. Okay, doctor. Yes, so ma now I will repeat. Okay. So, so first, first generation, uh, Cifa, um, Cephalixine and Cifa, Cifazoline, okay. second generation, Cifotaxime and Cifo, Cifoforine and Cifo, uh, Cifachlorine, yes? Okay. It's fake, Fox, four. Fake, four? Uh, Cifachlorine. Cifachlor. Fox, four? Cifachlor. Fox, four? Uh, Cifotaxime? Uh, no, Cifoxidine. Cifoxidine. Okay, Very good. Again. I really appreciate your coming over here. Next one is far, far for. Cephoforin. Cephuroxin. Cephuroxin. Okay. Okay. So cephazoline, cephalexine. These are the first. Second is fake fox fur, fake four, cephaclor, cephoxidine, mm -hmm. and cephuroxin. Third. Mm -hmm. Third one is 
Safe reaction and uh, we have tax. Tax, tax for? C for uh, tax Taxim. C for tax C for tax So try tax. Ford for? Fourth, uh, BIM, CFE BIM. CFE BIM, very good. Fifth is rolling. CFAT rolling. CFAT rolling. CFAT rolling. rolling, okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Osam, for helping. You are welcome. Well. Okay, very good. So once again, number one, okay, the reason why I'm putting a lot of attention to this is if I if they mention a uh, uh, generation of cephalosporin and you do not know which generation they are talking about, you will not be able to answer whether the drug is targeting pseudomonas or the drug is targeting MARSA or enterococcus or gram positives or gram negatives because there are a lot of high yield things which I mentioned from first to fifth, that is from first to fifth, the coverage will change from positives to negatives. Third will cover pseudomonas. Fifth will cover MARSA and enterococcus, but not pseudomonas, okay? So these are the thing. And then you have hens and peck. First will cover peck. Second will cover hens and peck. Along with first, along with gram positive, so these are the things why you have to realize and understand and memorize the names of cephalosporin drugs. Okay, adverse effects. Let's go back to adverse effects. Adverse effects, hypersensitivity reactions. We know this. Just the same way penicillins cause hypersensitivity, cephalosporins can also do the same thing. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Okay, do we have any physician over here who has act who has participated or performed in a ward or something where they have prescribed penicillin? Have you ever prescribed penicillin? Okay. When you write the order for penicillin, do you write the order for penicillin to initially give it in a certain dose? And then if there is no reaction, then the dose shall be increased, right? Okay, so what do we do when we prescribe the penicillin? At first, we give a certain dose of the penicillin in the patient, and then we we ask the nurse or we try to stay there and see if there is any reaction or not. We do a sensitivity test, right? So we try to see if there is any reaction or not. If there is no reaction, we uh, increase the dose of the penicillin. If there is reaction, we stop the drug, okay, and prescribe steroids or any other anti um, or, or any other antihistamines for that matter. Okay, so that's what we do. So that's why hypersensitivity reactions are always number one. So as a physician, you always have to remember to do a sensitivity test before you prescribe your patients penicillins and cephalosporins. Next one is IHA, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Okay, A I H A. Okay, then we have disulfiram like reactions over here. That's not very high yield. Vitamin K deficiency, that is high yield low rate of cross-reactivity, even in penicillin allergic patients, and increased nephrotoxicity with aminoglycosides, okay? Um, we'll talk about this later. You can, you can talk about all the nephrotoxic drugs later, okay? So just focus on two things, autoimmune and hypersensitivity reactions, okay? These are the two things. Nephrotoxic drugs, I'll tell you a mnemonic at the end of the lecture for, ne for nephrotoxic drugs, so you don't have to worry about this right now. Mechanism of resistance, once again, inactivated by cephalosporinase. It's the same thing as penicillinase. So that's that. So over here, write this down. Okay, over here, write it down that cephalosporin. Okay, mechanism of resistance is cephalosporinase. Okay, cephalosporinase. Okay, now. Let's talk about beta-lactamase inhibitors. That is, beta-lactamase inhibitors are the drugs that we prescribe with beta-lactam sensitive penicillins or cephalosporins. And these are casts. Casts are clavulonics, avibactam, salbactam, and tazobactam. Okay. For example, we gave, we gave amoxicillin clavulonate, ceftazidim, avibactam. Ceftazidim is a third generation cephalosporin which works against pseudomonas, there's tri, tax, and then ceftazidim, we didn't pay a lot of attention to this, but ceftazidim can be combined with avibactam. Then we have ampicillin and salbactam and piperacillin plus tazobactam, piperacillin, tazobactam, used first line use for pseudomonas, okay? So clavulonic, avibactam, salbactam, tazobactam, often added to penicillin antibiotics to protect the antibiotic from destruction by beta-lactamase. Uh, you will get this question 100% in you will, okay? What is the mechanism of action of 
either clavulunic, avibactam, salbactam, or tazobactam, that is, they prevent the beta lactamase from destroying the penicillin. Okay, that's that. Next one, carbapenem. Okay, carbapenems are a dime, meaning that we say that something is a dime when that thing is very important. Okay, so basically, carbapenem. For example, we for, for example, um, we say that something is a dime, meaning dime is used as a sort of a conversation proposition where it's used to um, propose something that is very important. The reason why we use dimes and dimes are the mnemonic for these ones is that carbapenems, these are life-saving uh, antibiotics, meaning that when everything is not, when, when, when nothing is working, when all the other drugs are resistant, dime antibiotics are given when there is 10 out of 10 life-threatening infection. Okay, these are the last group of defense. Dimes, dimes are doripenum, imipenum, meropenum, and irtapenum, artapenum, okay? Over here, meropenum is more high yield. That's used more or less on a daily basis. So dor doripenum, imipenum, meropenum, or artapenum, okay? Mechanism of action is, um, they are broad spectrum beta lactamase resistant um, carbapenum, always administered with celestine. This is high yield, okay? The reason is these drugs, they are administered with celestin because they are more prone to be broken down by this enzyme over here, that is renal di uh, dehydropeptides one, okay? So to prevent the action of renal dehydropeptides, these drugs are prescribed with um, celestin. So celestin is used to inhibit renal dihydropeptides, I mean dehydropeptides, and as a result, these drugs can work better due to inactivation of drug in renal tubules. As well. that's, that's the reason. So this is a question, okay? Why do we prescribe celestin with carbapenem? The reason why we prescribe celestin with carbapenem is to inhibit renal dehydropeptides one so that carbapenems can work better, okay? So that carbapenems can work better. Which, where is carbapenem working? Fast access, please. What is the mechanism of action? Once again, according to the diagram. Carbapenems. What is the mechanism of action of carbapenems? Where is carbapenem working? Peptidoglycan cross-linking. Okay, good. Peptidoglycan cross-linking. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. Now, clinical use. The clinical use of carbapenem is that they're used with gram-positive cocci, gram-negative uh, gram ne gram negative rods, and anaerobes. They're, they're used for gram-positive cocci, gram-negative rods, and anaerobes. They have a wider spectrum and significant side effects, limit use of life-threatening infections or other drugs that fail. Now, do we use this as the first line of defense against organisms? Yes or no? Do we use this as the first line of defense against organisms? Okay. Is it possible to, to get some faster answers, please? Okay, please put your attention to the lecture and please try to provide a bit faster answers. No, the answer is no, because we can't provide meropenem as the first line of defense because meropenem is used for later purposes. Basically, if everything fails, for example, penicillins are failing, cephalosporins are failing, you have to have a last line of, uh, last line of defense to prevent the bacteria from full on, uh, full on going through sepsis, okay, making the patient go through sepsis and septic shock. So in order to do, do this, we have to keep the dimes for the later use, okay, dimes for later use. So meropenem has a decreased risk of seizures and is stable to, die, to dehydropeptides 1A. So meropenem is one drug over here for DIME. For everything else, you need celestin. That's why meropenem is used more frequently because for meropenem, we do not have to prescribe celestin. So meropenem can work without celestin and exert their mechanism of action. That is, once again, don't forget that they are peptidoglycan cross-linking preventers, okay? That's that. Adverse effects can cause rash, GI distress, CNS toxicities at high plasma level. Over here, the only thing that you have to remember is dimes cause seizures, okay? Seizure. 
they can cause hypersensitivity and all the other things that penicillin causes, but this is way more particular to dimes. Mechanism of resistance is once again carbapenemase produced by Klebsiella E. coli, enterococcus. So right down over here. Okay. Okay. Dimes and right down carbapenemase. Okay, carbapenemase. Okay, so that's what you would do. Carbapenemase. Next one. Now, monobactams. Have we are we done with this one? Are we done with the peptidoglycan cross linkings? Yes or no? Okay. What is the mechanism of what is the what are the names of the drugs that prevent peptidoglycan synthesis? What are the names of the drugs that prevent peptidoglycan synthesis? Vancomycin and polymyxin is not the right answer. Okay, vancomycin and bacitracin. Very good. Vancomycin and bacitracin. Okay. Now, vancomycins and bacitracin. Uh, oh, before that, I think we left our monobactam. Mon monobactams are once again uh, peptidoglycan cross-linking preventers. Okay, before we jump into back into vancomycin, monobactams are as trilam. They're less susceptible to beta lactamase. They prevent peptidoglycan cross-linking by binding to penicillin binding protein, the same mechanism of action. Synergistic with the aminoglycosides, no cross allergenicity with penicillins. Uh, the fact that they're synergistic with the with aminoglycoside, this is the only thing that you have to remember for astronym. Okay. Clinical use that they're used for gram negative rods only, no activity against gram positive rods or NR and Arabs for penicillin allergic patients and those with renal insufficiency who cannot tolerate aminoglycoside. Because basically, Astronam is given for patients who cannot tolerate aminoglycoside. That's all you have to remember. A4, aminoglycosides, A4, astronam. Okay, so patients who cannot take aminoglycosides, we prescribe astronam. That's the only thing you have to remember from astronam. Nothing else, okay? I, I am telling you exactly what you need to know for a quick, faster revision for the next time and also for this time too. The fact that they're only used for gram negative rods only, it's not very high yield because the question stem will mention the names of the drugs regardless and the names of the organism regardless, okay? So focus more on these things over here. Now, vancomycin. Vancomycin and bacitracine, these are peptidoglycan synthesis preventers, not cross-linking preventers. So they inhibit cell wall peptidoglycan formation. How? They prevent formation by, what they do is, Previously, penicillins and cephalosporins inhibited transpeptidase. Now, the vancomycin and bacitracine, they bind to the alanine portion of the cell wall. And, they pre and uh, when they bind to the alanine portions of the cell wall, they, pre they uh, physically prevent, I mean, mechanically prevent one alanine to bind with another alanine because the portions of the binding sites are blocked off by the drug itself, vancomycin. So instead of prevention of transpeptides, they bind to alanine and they uh, throughout prevent the alanines from binding with each other and forming the cell wall. As, as, as a result, they prevent peptidoglycan synthesis. So that's that. They are not susceptible to beta lactamase. Okay, they're bactericidal against most bacteria. Except for Clostridium difficile, they're bacteriostatic, not high yield. Don't worry about this. Clinical use is for gram positive bugs only. And then they're also used for MARSA. Okay, they're used for MARSA. Staph, epi staph epidermidis is also used. But over here, the only thing you have to focus on is MARSA. Okay, adverse effects, it's, it's well tolerated, but it's not, it's not trouble free. The only thing that you, that you can, you can, um, uh, you can forget. All the other all the other adverse effects for vancomycin, but you cannot forget red man syndrome. Vancomycin causing red man syndrome. You necessarily do not have to do, remember nephrotoxicity, autotoxicity, but I highly suggest you do because 
there are some questions about autotoxicities and vancomycin in emboss. Okay, the fact that vancomycin causes autotoxicity. The, the, the thing is, the, this drug, they have a tendency of attacking the sensory uh, neuronal hair cells of uh, the organ of corti. Okay, so then they, they cause autotoxicity. That's that. They can cause thrombophlebitis. That's not very high yield, but autotoxicity and red man syndrome. Okay, you cannot afford to forget these two things. Red man syndrome is idiopathic reaction, large prevent, um, red, um, they can cause flushing and red man syndrome. Another one is over here, as you can see, it's idiopathic reaction, which is uh, largely preventable by pretreatment with antihistamine. Basically, you, if you have the knowledge that vancomycin can cause red man syndrome, you can prevent this sort of presentation by prescribing antihistamines previously to prescribing vancomycin. Now, can I ask you guys, what are, can you name one other drug that can cause red man syndrome? We talked about this before. Another drug that can cause red man syndrome? Morphine. Morphine is not very high yield for causing red man syndrome at all. Okay. Anyone else with, with any other better answer? Fibrates. Okay. Another one? Anyone else? Niacin. There, there we go. Okay. That's what I was looking for. Niacin is responsible for causing red man syndrome. Fibrates are also there to some extent, but niacin, niacin, vancomycin. Okay. These are the drugs. Mechanism of, of resistance is occurs in a bacteria via amino acid modification of D alanine to D alanine to D lactate. So basically, vancomycin will bind to alanine. But what if a bacteria has mutated his peptidic glycan cell, uh, his peptidic glycan cells from alanine to 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 D LSE? Now, vancomycin cannot work over there. So the mechanism of resistance of vancomycin. Okay, mechanism of resistance of vancomycin is mutation from D alanine to D alanine to D LSE. Okay, so that's that. Next one. Next ones are PSIs. Okay. So they did not uh, give a lot of attention to bacitracine, but but we would like to expect that bacitracine works in the same way as vancomycin, so that's that, okay? Now, are we ready to begin PSIs? Is everyone with me? Do I have everyone's attention? Okay, now, by at 30 cell, at 50. Who can tell me the breakdown of this mnemonic really quick? Either you can tell me or you can tell me, yes or no. Who can tell me the name, the breakdown of this mnemonic very quick? Anyone? Very good. Amino glycosides, tetracycline for 30 S ribosomes. And then next one. Cell at 50, cell at 54. Chloramphenicol, clindamycin, erythromycin, linozolin, very good. And then there was also streptogamines. Okay, do not forget streptogamines. Streptogamines are quinipristine and dafopristine. So that's another one. So they are going to work at 50S ribosomes. Now, Let's look at this one. Okay, let's look at um, okay. Let's look at this one over here. That is PSIs, protein synthesis inhibitors. Okay, PSIs are amino glycosides. Okay, um, for example, they work at the 30s 30s ribosomes. What you can see over here is that when the tRNA brings the um, mRNA and it also goes to the cytoplasm to go bring the amino acids back to the ribosome so that the peptide bond can form in the ribosomes and the amino acid can form. This is inhibited if the type, if the 30S ribosomes are already blocked by a drug. So 
if the 30S ribosome is blocked by a drug, basically if the bacteria wants to survive, it has to uh, replicate and it has to multiply, right? So when a bacteria will infect a cell, they will try to change uh, the cells. If they, I mean, they would try to use the host's architecture to form new proteins, new bacterial proteins. So if you can prescribe these drugs that blocks one ribosome that and another ribosome, so basically they will block the 30S and then the 50S. So these new bacterial proteins will not take place. And as a result, the bacteria, they cannot exert their, mechan their, uh, their pathogenic mechanism. But having said that, these drugs do not directly go and target the bacteria itself. They only prevent bacterial protein synthesis. As a result, these are bacteriostatic, okay? These are bacteria. So basically, all are basically bacteriostatic except aminoglycosides and linozolate, which are bactericidal or bacteriostatic. That is variable. Specifically targets smaller bacterial, bacterial ribosomes, that is 70S. 30S and 50S, leaving human ribosomes unaffected. There's a question in EMBOSS that why don't uh, protein synthesis inhibitors affect normal human protein synthesis? They do not do that because they do not target ATS. ATS is the ones which we have, and they, these are the ones that they go and attack the bacterial um, ribosomes. So bacterial ribosomes are 30S and 50 and the 50 s So now, let's talk, let's talk about aminoglycosides at first. Okay, let's talk about aminoglycosides at first. Okay. Now, uh, do we have any student over here who is a big fan of the rapper Eminem? Anyone? No one's a fan of Eminem? Okay, only one student. Okay, so this mnemonic is not gonna work. But for Dr. Fagan, GNATS, okay, this is a new song from Eminem, okay. I was really hoping that this would work as a mnemonic, but since you guys have not or do not like Eminem, so we'll talk about gentamicine, neomycine, hemicacine, tobramycine, and streptomycine, so amino glycosides, okay. GNATS are GNATS, so GNATS. GNATS is basically a song by a new rapper, I mean, it's a new song by rapper Eminem. Okay, I was really hoping that you guys heard of Eminem, but you guys didn't. So, GNATs are the ones. GNATs are the mnemonic for aminoglycosides. Gentamicine, neomycine, amicacine, tobramycine, streptomycine. Do I have everyone's attention? Yes or no? Can everyone hear my voice? Okay. No. Okay. So, these are bactericidal. They are irreversible inhibitors of initiation complex through binding of the 30S ribosomal subunit, okay? Now, from the mechanism of action, there are two things which I want you to remember because there are so many informations in first aid that you do not have the time to remember binding to initiation complex and this and that. Just focus on these two things, 30S, and they require oxygen for uptake, therefore ineffective against anaerobes. These are the two things. So you do not have to pay a lot of, um, you do not have to work really hard to remember that aminoglycosides work at the 30S ribosomes. If you remember the mnemonic, buy at 30 and sell at 50. But along with this, if you can remember that they require oxygen for uptake. So in an Arabic, they are not effective. So they're ineffective in anaerob. That is, these are the two things, okay? Another one is, these, these are bactericidal. The reason they're bactericidal is because they're irreversible inhibitors of initiation complex. They're not reversible inhibitors. As a result, they break down the whole bacterial structure. So most of them are bacteriostatic, except aminoglycoside, which is bacteriostatal, because they are irreversible because they are irreversible inhibitors of initiation complex. Mm -hmm. The clinical use is they're used for gram-negative rod infections and they're synergistically used with beta-lactam antibiotics. Now, which beta-lactam antibiotics works well with aminoglycoside? We just studied the, or the name of the drug. Which beta-lactam works with aminoglycoside? Very good. 
Astronome. A4 astronome. A4 aminoglycoside. Now, next one is uh, neomycin for bowel surgery that's not higher. Adverse effect. Adverse effect is that they are very nephrotoxic. Nephrotoxic, autotoxic. These are the only two things. Okay. The fact is that they're more autotoxic with loop diuretics, basically with, with furosemide and then uh, ethoclinic acids and then torsamides. Furosemide, torsamide, ethoclinic acid, these are the loop diuretics. If you use aminoglycoside with loop diuretics, they, they, this can cause sensorineural hearing loss. So they, they are autotoxic and they're also nephrotoxic. Okay. Mechanism of resistance is bacterial transfer enzymes inactivate the bacteria by acetylation, phosphorylation, and adenylation. So write this down over here, that aminoglycoside, they can get deactivated by acetylation, phosphorylation, and adenylation. These are the three processes of resistance or three process of the mechanism of resistance of amino glycosides. Okay. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Are we clear about this? Okay, good. Now, tetracycline, okay, by at 30, at four amino glycosides at tetracycline. So tetracyclines is doxycycline, tetracycline, okay? Now, tetracycline, these are bacteriostatic. Once again, the only two things you have to focus on is they will bind to 30S. And since they are, since they are not irreversible, they are reversible preventers of protein synthesis. So they are bacteriostatic. So they will bind and prevent the attachment of amino acid TR, R, T, RNA. Over there, it was irreversible inhibitions of initiation complex. Over here, it's reversible uh, prevention of attachment of amino acid tRNA, prevent attachment of amino acid tRNA, limited CNS penetration. Doxycycline is fecally eliminated and can be used in patients with renal failure, okay? This is one emboss question, so I'm just gonna give a star mark over here for emboss that the, the, there's a question that you have a patient who has been prescribed um, a tetracycline and the patient's serum creatinine has increased. So which other group of drugs shall he be transferred to? The answer is doxycycline because doxycycline is, is fecally eliminated, not eliminated via urine. So doxycycline cannot be, uh, can be used as a replacement for tetracycline. Do not take tetracycline with milk and acids or iron containing preparations because divalent cations will inhibit drug absorption in the drug. Okay, will, will, inhibit, will inhibit drugs absorption. So don't take it with calcium or magnesium, as a matter of fact. So no matter what, no, no matter what they're talking about, antacids or milk, basically these two things, they will prevent the absorption of the drug. Clinical use is for Borrelia. If you can remember this, that's enough. Okay, they're also used to treat acne. Doxycycline is effective uh, against community acquired MARSA, not high yield. So don't worry about it. Adverse effects is GI, GI distress, photosensitivity that's there, but the only one that you need to remember is teeth discoloration. So teeth for tetracycline. Okay, this is why it's high yield. Tetracycline. By tetracycline, we mean they cause, they cause Teeth discoloration. Mechanism of resistance, once again, decrease uptake or increase efflux of bacteria by plasmid and coated transport pumps. So what they do is the bacterial plasmids, they can, they can uh, get rid of the drugs by efflux of the drugs from the bacterial cytoplasm out, outside of the bacteria. So they can either prevent uptake or increase Efflux, meaning that they will not allow the drug to come inside. And if the drug comes inside, they will throw the drug outside of the bacterial, cyto bacterial cytoplasm. And the organelle which is responsible for doing that is bacterial plasmid. So over here you have tetracyclines. Mechanism of resistance is decrease uptake or 
increase efflux by plasmids. Okay. Is everyone clear? Is everyone clear? Now, next one. Okay. Next one. Next one is tigacycline. Tigacycline has the same mechanism of action more or less to tetracycline. They will bind to the 30S, inhibit protein synthesis, generally bacteriostatic. Uh, broad spectrum anaerobic gram negative and gram positive coverage, MARSA or infections requiring deep tissue penetrations. Adverse effects are GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting. So, tigacycline, only thing you have to remember is tigacycline are the same as tetracycline, bind to 30S. That's the only thing. You do not have to focus on, on anything else. So, you can easily move on from over here. Not, not, not a lot of questions are going to come. So, let's move on to the next one. That is chloramphenicol and clindamycin. Now, are we done with the 30S inhibitors? Yes or no? Okay. What are the 50S inhibitors? What are the 50S inhibitors? Fifty S. Fifty S. We have cell, right? Cell for chloramphenicol, clindamycin, streptogamins, erythromycin, linozolid. Okay. Now, chloramphenicol. Let's talk about chloramphenicol first. Chloramphenicol, first of all, they will not work at 30S. They will work at 50S ribosomal subunit. And how will they work? Basically, they will block peptidyl transferase. They will block peptidyl transferase as the enzyme that is required for forming the peptide bonds in between, um, the, in between the peptides that are bought one from uh, the cytoplasm all the way to the ribosomes according to the information provided by the messenger RNA. So um, the enzyme peptidyl transferase, if you block this enzyme, then the peptide linkage between the amino acids will not form. And as a result, bacterial protein synthesis will stop. So you, this is bacteriostatic. Over here, we prescribe chloramphenicols for meningitis, and rickettsial disease, limited use due to toxicity, but often still used in developing countries because of low cost. So chloramphenicol, it's not very high yield. I'm gonna tell you why, because we do not really use chloramphenicol anymore because the toxicity of this drug is really high, okay? Because they can cause anemia, uh, aplastic anemia, right? Aplastic anemia, they cause aplastic, they, they cause aplastic anemia and they can cause gray baby syndrome. So we do not prescribe chloram, chloramphenicol. Mechanism of resistance is that plasmid encoded acetyl transferase will inactivate the drug. Only thing you have to remember about chloramphenicol is their bacteriostatic works at 50S. Mechanism of, of, of resistance for chloramphenicol is acetyl transferase. So over here, chloramphenicol is acetyl transferase will, ina will inactivate the drug. Okay. And which, which organelle is responsible for this enzyme? The organelle that is responsible for this enzyme are bacterial plasmids. Okay, that's that. Clindamycin, high yield. Okay. They work at 50S ribosomal subunit and block peptide transfer. Same mechanism of action. They will block the transfer of peptides, prevent bacterial protein synthesis, and they are bacteriostatic. The reason why clindamycines are very high yield is because when we use clindamycin for anaerobic for anaerobic infections, for example, in aspiration pneumonia, we use clindamycin. And this is a question: What antibiotic do we use in aspiration pneumonia in stroke patients? Lung abscess, we use clindamycin, and oral infections, we use clindamycin. We also use clindamycin for acne. So any anaerobic infection above the diaphragm, we use clindamycin, and anything below the diaphragm, we use metronidazole for anaerobics. Now. Adverse effect wise, clindamycin is high yield because of its adverse effect because clindamycin long-term use can lead to pseudomembranous colitis, clostridium, de clostridium difficile, okay? Fever, diarrhea, and then all of those things. And when you do a colonoscopy over, over there, you see a grayish pseudomembrane. So that's called pseudomembranous colitis and clindamycin is highly responsible for doing that, okay? 
so we are at which portion of we are at which portion let's come back here okay are you guys with me is uh, am i going too fast or am i going too slow is the pace of the lecture okay <clears throat> does anyone have any questions okay but many information no that's the thing the information is actually not many i have tried to concise the information into absolutely important things and absolutely important things meaning that the things which you only have to remember always remember that you guys are done learning the mechanism of actions of antibiotics from this um diagram already peptidoglycan crosslinkers vancomycin bacitracine and now we are talking about 50s and 30s we're already done with 30s we're already done with 30s perfect now we're talking about 50 years. We're done with chloramphenicol and clindamycin. Next one. Okay, next one is we, we have to go and talk about erythromycin and linozolids. Erythromycin represents macrolids. So we'll talk about linozolid first. Okay, linozolid. Are we ready to begin this? Is, is everyone with me? Okay. Linozolid. Linozolid is once again, they will work at 50 as ribosomal subunits. So they will, they are bacteriostatic. They will inhibit protein synthesis. Now, uh, aminoglycoside was an irreversible inhibitor of initiation complex. This is prevention of initiation complex. Okay. If you do not want to focus on this one, if you can only remember that they work on 50 S ribosomal subunit, that's more than enough. Okay, for linozolid, that's more than enough. They're used for MARSA and vancomycin resistant enterococci, BRD. Adverse effect wise is bone marrow suppression, peripheral neuropathy, serotonin syndrome. Now, this is the only thing that is high yield. Do you guys remember, I tried to draw a picture in your head for serotonin syndrome, ondansetron and tram tracks. Do you guys remember that? Who, who remembers that? Who remembers? that thing i remember i tried to draw up write a villa right okay good so over there you have linozolid linozolid is serotonin serotonin syndrome it causes serotonin syndrome this is right tricycle very good so that is how you mechanism of resistance is if there is a mutation of ribosomal rna then linozolid will not work okay so write this down over here linozolid is Linozolid mechanism of resistance is point mutation, mutation in rRNA. Now, having said that, there's one more thing I want you to know is linozolid is used for skin infections more or less. Okay, gram positive skin infections and uh, those those things. So linozolid is used for basically it's used for skin infections. Okay. Now, next one. Next one is erythromycin. So cell at 50, er erythromycin for macrolids. If we say erythromycin, uh, then the next two macrolids should come straight away from your tongue as uh, as, as, as as fast as you say erythromycin is as it is, azithromycin and clarithromycin. These are ACE drugs, okay? Azithromycin is very widely used more or less for, this is the first line of antibiotics prescribed for almost anything, any other thing over here in the United States. Basically you go to a primary care physician. Okay, if you go to, do I have any student over here who's living in the United States? Who is living in the United States? Dr. Dr. Iman, Dr. Mahmoud, Dr. Nikki. So if you guys were to visit your PCP, I'm pretty sure you guys were prescribed Zmax or, right? Azithromycin. It's it's almost prescribed like chocolates. So um, azithromycin is the first line of drug that we prescribe over here as physician. It's a bacteriostatic drug, meaning that it will bind to the 23S ribosomal RNA of the 50S. So they are very specific to where they bind. Not only will they bind to the 50S, they will bind to the 23S ribosomal RNA segment of the 50S ribosomal subunit. And when they do that, they will block 
protein synthesis by, blo by blocking translocation. This is high yield. For all the other things, knowing that they bind to 30S and binding to 50S, that was enough. But since macrolids are a more common drug, I highly, highly suggest that you do not leave anything out from macrolids because we prescribe macrolids over here a lot. Okay, so macrolids, I'm just gonna give two stars over here. They not only do they bind to the 50S, they bind to the 23S ribosomal RNA of the 50S and they prevent translocation. Okay, so macro slides, meaning that preventing of translocation, they prevent the sliding of the peptidyl RNA. Eight, uh, their mechanism of action is they're used for pneumonias, atypical pneumonia, mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella. Do you guys remember we talked about this, that uh, what was the cause of walking pneumonia, that when you were walking around and then all of a sudden you had pneumonia, what was the organism responsible for, for that one? Which organism was responsible for walking pneumonia? Mycoplasma. So if anyone goes to a physician over here and, and the most common complaints are that, uh, okay, doctor, I have a fever, cough, and uh, this, which, which antibiotic do you think the doctor would prescribe first? Which antibiotic do you think the doctor would prescribe first? Azithromycin, exactly. So it's prescribed for walking pneumonia. Okay, atypical pneumonia, you have mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella. Then it's also used for sexually transmitted infections, that is chlamydia. And it's also used for gram positives, that is streptococcal infections. And those who are allergic to penicillin, we can give azithromycin or macrolids. Okay, adverse effects. Adverse effects is that they can cause GI distress, GI motility problem. Okay, do you guys remember that for patients who has diabetic gastroparesis, we prescribed erythromycin. Who remembers that information from our U-World notes or and also endocrine, endocrine lecture? What is, and what is another drug that we prescribe in diabetic gastroparesis? What, what is another drug that we prescribe in diabetic gastroparesis? Metoclopramide, very good. Okay, metoclopramide and and erythromycin, so gastromotility issues. They can also cause arrhythmia, right? Because do you remember A, B, C, D, E for increased QT prolongations, right? Torsades, they point, anti-arrhythmic, antibiotics, then antipsychotics, then antidepressants, anti-emetics, torsades, they point over here there. Antibiotics had macrolids. So they can increase QT prolongation and cause torsades, they point, Okay, so we cannot use them for patients who have um, arrhythmia-like issues. Acute cholestatic hepatitis, okay? They can cause cholestatic hepatitis. They prevent um, bile motility. I mean, they, they prevent the proper motility of the bile, so they can cause cholestasis. Rash and eosinophilia. Increased serum concentration of theophylline, oral anticoagulants. Diathromycin and erythromycin will inhibit cytochrome P450. You do not have to learn this right now because we will learn the cytochrome P450 inhibitors as a whole later. And the fact that they increase serum concentrations of theophylline and uh, oral anticoagulants is very low yield. So you do not have to worry about this. This is high yield. Mechanism of resistance. I assure you 100%, if there's any mechanism of resistance you will be tested on, it's this one. Methylation of 23S ribosomal RNA will prevent binding. So you know like how this drug binds to the 23S ribosomal RNA of the 50S ribosomal subunit, they, they are very specific to where they bind, okay? They are almost like um, those people who will not sit anywhere and everywhere, you know? Like, you know, like how you have people who go to the bus stand and, you know, they are too posh and, and, and sophisticated to sit on the bus stands. I mean, to sit on the bus stand, they would rather stand or those people, when they go on some sort of a party or something, they will not mix with a lot of other people because they they are very um, they are very sophisticated, or that's what they would like to think, right? They're very nosy, and they only would like to sit at a certain place and talk to certain people. Yes or no? Do you guys have any any, any idea who, what I'm talking about, or am I just mumbling by myself? Have I painted a picture in your head? Have you guys understood what I'm talking about? No, I, I'm talking about 
people, you know how there are some people who are very selective about the places they go and sit. They will, they are very posh people, they are very sophisticated, they will not go and sit anywhere and everywhere. Okay, their macrolids are not like the other antibiotics that they can just go and bind 250S and prevent action. Macrolids are those poshy, sophisticated antibiotics. Do you understand what I mean? The reason I'm saying this is not only will they bind to 50S, they have to bind to 23S ribosomal RNA of 50S. Okay, so they are very selective. Okay, so they are those poshy, sophisticated type of people who cannot sit in a, in a public area sort of an antibiotic. The reason I'm, I'm talking about these things is because I want to paint a picture in your head about macrolids, okay? I really do not have anything against poshy, sophisticated people, okay? They can be whoever they want to be. The reason why I'm talking about this is because I want you guys to understand macrolids are the same. So if you, pre, if you break the 23S or for example, that poshy, sophisticated, place where they want to go and sit. If you go and you break the sit, will they be able to sit and, make, and exert their mechanism of action? Yes or no? Fast answers, please. No. So if you go and you destroy the 23S ribosomal RNA binding site, then these poshy antibiotics cannot go and exert their mechanism of action. So macrolids, they have a tendency of going to 50S ribosomal subunit and binding to 23S ribosomal RNA. So if there is any problem with 23S ribosomal RNA, so macrolids, if there is any problem with mutation of 23S ribosomal RNA, right, then they cannot make, exert the mechanism of action. So that's that, okay. Now, polymyxine, okay. So with that, I think we're done with, I think we're done with 50S, we're done with 30S, okay. Are, are we clear about this, yes or no? Are we clear about this? Okay, now let's talk about the bacteria, I mean, the anti antibiotics or the antimicrobials, which works on the cell membrane. What are the names of the cell membrane integrity preventers? Which antibiotics work over here? Daptomycin and polymyxine. Okay, daptomycin and polymyxines. Okay. So polymyxines and daptomycines, they are cell membrane integrity preventers. So polymyxine E is also called cholestin and polymyxine B is there. Basically, they are cation polypeptides that bind to phospholipids on the cell membrane and they disrupt the cell membrane integrity, leakage of cellular components and cell death. Okay. The only thing you can remember from over here is, is two things. Number one is Polymyxines are cell membrane, cell membrane uh, formation inhibitors or cell membrane integrity preventers. And another one is their cation proteins. So you can make it up in your own words that cation proteins that prevent the cell membrane from functioning or I mean from, that prevent the cell membrane from forming. And we all know that, that the cell membrane is, uh, is responsible for maintaining the cellular integrity. So if the bacteria loses the cell membrane, there will be leakage of the, of the cytoplasm and the bacteria would obviously die. Clinical use is that they're used for salvage therapy for multi-drug resistance gram-negative bacteria. Once again, they're also one of the uh, second to last line of defense against um, organisms. Basically, if everything starts failing, then we prescribe daptomycins and polymyxine. Polymyxine B is a component of triple antibiotic ointment used for superficial skin infection. Not high yield, don't, don't worry about this, okay? Just two things are important, cations and cell membrane formation preventers. And at adverse effect wise, they are nephrotoxic, neurotoxic, and they can cause respiratory failure. Once again, don't worry about these things, especially the adverse effects of polymyxines, they're not very widely tested. And once again, when we go to pharmacology over there, 
we would read nephrotoxic drugs and neurotoxic drugs, and that will cover polymyxenes by itself. Okay, now, so that's all. Next one, we have a question. Is it the same we use with carbapenem? We use with carbapenem. What did it say with carbapenem? What did it say? I'm not sure what your question is. Could you please rephrase your question or unmute yourself? And... Yes, celestin is a, is a renal dehydropeptide is there's one inhibitor. Okay, yes. You're mixing up cholestin with celestin. Oh, okay. Don't mix up cholestin with celestin. Celestin is something else. Cholestin is something else, okay? Celestin is a renal dihydropeptide as one inhibitor. Renal dehydropeptide as one is responsible for breaking down carbapenem. That's why we prescribe celestins. Cholestin is polymyxine. That's this is something else. Okay. Okay. Are we clear? Can I can we move on to over here? Can we move on here? Okay. Now, do you guys remember from yesterday's drawing, we had another small piece of information over here that para-aminobenzoic acid was converted to dihydrofolate? Yes, mechanism of reason, dihydrofolate. And dihydrofolate was converted to tetrahydrofolate. Do you guys remember this? Yes or no? Right. This tetrahydrofolate that is being formed over here, will this help maintain the DNA structure or not? Okay. Well, what are the drugs that works in this pathway that we learned yesterday? Sulfonamide, then trimethoprim, then sulfonamides and trimethoprim, more or less. These are the two that we studied yesterday. Okay, so that's all. You, if you can remember these two, that's more than enough. Okay, as you can see over here, okay, let me write this whole thing over here so that it's better for you. Okay, so what's happening over here is you have Okay, what's happening over here is you have para-aminobenzoic acid. Para-aminobenzoic acid is converted to dihydropteric acid. Okay, they are before they're converted to dihydrofolate reductase, right? They are converted to a, another pre-substrate that is dihydroopteric acid. Okay, and the enzyme is dihydrooptrate, dihydrooptrate synthase. Okay, so dihydrooptrate synthase, dihydrooptrate synthase will convert paraminobenzoic acid to dihydrooptrate acid. And it's over here that sulfonamides will work. Then dihydrooptrate acid is converted to dihydrofolic acid and dihydrofolic acid is converted to tetrahydrofolic acid. So dihydrofolic acid is converted. Dihydrofolic acid is converted to tetrahydrofolic acid, and tetrahydrofolic acid is then converted to purines, pyrimidines, and like whatever the uh, DNA portions. The enzyme that's working over here is dihydrofolate reductase. Okay, dihydrofolate reductase, and the drug that's working over here is trimethoprene. So if I ask you the mechanism of action of sulfonamide, can you please remember that they inhibit dihydrooptrate synthase? And if I ask you the mechanism of trimethoprene, please try to remember that they inhibit dihydrofolate reductase. Am I clear? Yes or no? Okay. okay. So Sulfonamides. Sulfonamides, you have sulfomethoxazole and sulfioxazole and sulfadiazine. Over here, if you can remember sulfomethoxazole, that's more than high yield. 
Sulfamethasazole, they will inhibit dihydroalpyrosynthase, does inhibiting folate synthesis. These are bacteriostatic. They work for gram positive, gram negative, no cardia. And the only thing you can have to remember for clinical use is trimethoprime SMX is used for UDI. Okay. How many of us have prescribed or have had TMP SMX for UTI ourselves or prescribed UTI for us or prescribed UTI? Are we well acquainted with this? Yes or no? Trimethoprime, sulfamethasazole. Now, the next time, the next time when you prescribe your patients trimethoprime, sulfamethasazole, try to recapitulate the mechanism of action very fast. Okay. Okay. Try to remember that, that yes, I remember Dr. Haideri drew a picture like this where paraminobenzoic acid was converted to dihydroopteric acid in the presence of dihydroopteric synthase. So sulfonamide should work over here. And then dihydroopteric acid was converted to dihydrofolic acid. And it was, it was converted to tetrahydrofolate by dihydrofolate reductase. And trimethoprim is preventing the action of dihydrofolate reductase. So that's that. OK. Adverse effects. Adverse effects is hypersensitivity reactions, hemolysis of G6PD. They can cause they can cause G6PD, uh, G6PD G6PD hemolysis. Okay, so if you do not have G6PD, basically once again, if they can cause oxidative stress, and that oxidative stress can break down the RBC. So they they are nephrotoxic, and always remember this. This is one thing which you have to remember from sulfonamide that they can cause Steven Johnson syndrome. Okay, mechanism of resistance altered enzyme. Basically, if the bactericidal dihydroopteric synthase is not there, then sulfonamides will not work. Very simple. So sulfonamides work at dihydroopteric synthase. So if dihydroopteric synthase is not there, then sulfonamides will not work. So decrease dihydroopteric synthase. Okay. Now, Dapson. Before we go to Dapson, let's finish trimethoprim first. They will inhibit bacterial dihydrofolate reductase. Okay, they are used in combination with sulfonamide for UTI, and that's all you need to know. Okay, they, are, they, can, they can be also used for Shigella salmonella pneumocystis. That's not high yield, so don't worry about this. Trimethoprim then cause hyperkalemia in high doses, megaloblastic anemia, leukopenia, gran, granulocytopenia. Basically, do you guys realize something? that we also have this similar process in our in our in our cellular organelle yes or no do you guys realize that fast answers guys do we have a dihydrofolate reductase converting dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate yes or no yes if that process is not working because trimethoprim is there will we have the proper dnas No, if that is not there, then can we assume that we can get severe pancytopenia because they can suppress the bone marrow? They would prevent, you, you know, like how the bone marrow is responsible for all the uh, for all the synthesis of the precursors, right? So if we block it over there, then they can cause bone marrow suppression. Along with this, they can cause hyperkalemia. So these are the two things you have to remember for trimethoprim. First of all, mechanism of action it's one word second of all hyperkalemia and pancytopenia well if these are the two things you can remember then you are golden okay that's all you need dapson let's go to dapson over here dapson is similar to sulfonamides but structurally distinct dapson the, the only reason we would like to know about this it's because it's very selective to be chosen for the treatment for leprosy okay and they can also cause G6PD hemolysis. That's all. The mechanism of action is the same. That is dihydro upgrade synthase, and they are used for leprosy. Okay. Clofaxamine, Dapson, Rifampicin, right? You guys remember that? The treatment for lepromatous and tuberculoids. Okay. So, so that's that. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Okay. So would you guys want to take a break now and then come back and finish the rest? And, or do you guys want to continue? Break. Okay. 
But after we take the break, do you, uh, I need a promise for, from you guys. The, the promise which I need is after you guys come back from the break, make sure you guys take the break properly so that after you guys come back from the break, you guys can provide faster answers. Okay. Are we clear? I need faster answers from you guys. Have a good break. Drink coffee. Have, uh, if needed, take a break for 20 minutes instead of 15 minutes. But whenever you guys are back, make sure that the answer responses are faster. Okay, faster answer and answer responses. It's not for my benefit, it's for your benefit because I want to know if everyone is understanding or not because I can keep on giving the lectures throughout the entire day. The only reason why I don't do that is because you guys, I just, I just want to make sure if everyone is learning or not learning, okay? Always remember that if you guys have any questions, you guys are more than welcome to ask me please don't hesitate to do that. And the second thing is, if you guys cannot understand anything, if you ask me to repeat it, I'll repeat it. Not once, not twice. I'll do it three times, four times, okay? Because that's my job, I'll, I'll keep on doing it. But make sure that you guys understand everything that I have said. I personally believe that I, I, I have been going a little fast, okay? But since you guys have not been complaining, so that's the pace at which I'm going to go after I come back from the break. But make sure that you guys have a good break. How long do you guys want to take the break for? Fast answers, please. Okay, let's come back at 11.45 to 11.50 and let's finish this.
Okay, is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, good. So did you guys have a nice long break for 15 to 20 minutes and uh, rejuvenated yourself, came back refreshed? Okay. So are we ready to finish and put a NOS on the last couple of pages for microbiology? After that, we can successfully say that we have finished microbiology as a whole. <clears throat> okay. All right, so having said that, so we are done with cross linkers, we are done with PSIs, we are done with folate inhibitors, we are done with cell membrane integrity uh, preventers. Okay, right now we are going to focus on do you guys remember yesterday? One second. Okay. Do you guys remember yesterday we drew this thing, we drew the DNA and then we drew two enzymes over here. One was over here, another one was over here. Yes or no? DNA gyrase. If this is DNA gyrase, if this is DNA gyrase, what are the inhibitors of DNA gyrase? Fast answers, please. DNA gyrase inhibitors are fluoroquinolones and quinolone. Fluoroquinolones are ciprofloxacine, levofloxacines, right? These are DNA gyrase inhibitors. And <clears throat> We also have quinolones, which are the nalidixic acid. So let's start talking about fluoroquinolones. Okay, fluoroquinolones, we have ciprofloxacine, inoxacine, norfloxacine, ofloxacine. Okay, now over here, respiratory fluoroquinolones, we use gamifloxacine, levofloxacine. Okay, this is very high yield because levofloxacine is more common. And then Ciprofloxacine, inoxacine, they're also there, okay? Okay. Mechanism of action that is that, that they are DNA gyrus inhibitors. They inhibit DNA topoisomerase two, okay? If they target DNA topoisomerase two, what is the um, chemotherapeutic drug which targets topoisomerase two in humans? Etuposide and tenoposide, very good. Okay, they also target topoisomerase two and topoisomerase four, very good. They must not be taken with antibiotic with antacids because that will prevent their absorption. Okay, there is a question in U world that um, a physician prescribed a patient ciprofloxacine, but after taking the drug for two weeks the infection did not subside and the patient was also taking antacids okay why it did the mechan why did the drug not work the drug did not work because the antacids act as covalent compounds and prevent absorptions of the drug from the gut so that's that this is a question so put your stars over here they're used for gram negative rods urinary and gi tracts some gram positives are also there Adverse effects. Adverse effects is that they can cause GI upset, super infection, skin rashes, less commonly can cause leg cramps and myalgia. Okay, over here, <clears throat> what I need you to focus on is, I need you to focus on this because these are not that high yield, except the fact that um, the bone one is that fluoroquinolones hurts attachment to your bones. So they affect bones and they attach, they cause muscle cramps and myalgia. So myalgia and bone, that's what I want you to focus on. They're contraindicated in pregnant women and children less than 18 years due to possible cartilage damage. Well, what they do is they fluoroquinolones, they damage your cartilage. So they are contraindicated in less than 
18 years of age, and they may increase QT intervals, so it's better not to prescribe them in arrhythmic patients. They also cause tendonitis or tendon rupture in a patient more than 60 years. And this is very high yield because it's a question in your world. I'm not sure if you guys have received this question yet, or if you didn't, you will receive it in the future that there's a there is a 60 year old patient who was being prescribed ciprofloxacin. Now, all of a sudden, the patient has severe myalgia and uh, pain in the biceps region. What happened? What basically happened is that there was tendonitis and tendon rupture due to the ciprofloxacin that was prescribed. So this is a high yield question and you guys will get this question when you guys get this question. Remember that fluoroquinolones cause tendon rupture, okay? Mechanism of resistance is that they are cytochrome P450. Uh, mechanism of resistance is that they're chromosome encoded mutations in DNA gyres, plasmid mediated resistance and efflux pump. So over here in our resistance notebook. Okay. One second. Did you guys write down all the notes or for the drugs and the resistance? Yes or no? <clears throat> okay, because that's the only thing that you have to, that's a bit difficult that you have to memorize. The rest of the things you already know because you studied it from the diagram when we were doing the diagram, right? So over here, add this one to your, um, to your notes is that fluoroquinolones, okay, fluoroquinolones, they can have resistance by, they can have resistance by DNA gyrase, Mutations, mutations in DNA gyrase. Then plasmid mediated pumps and increased efflux, meaning that the pumps will push the drug out of the bacteria. So plasmid mediated pumps. Okay, so that's that. Next one. Okay. Daptomycin. Where did we study daptomycin once again? What is the mechanism of action of daptomycin? Very good. Which two antibiotics are responsible for maintaining cellular, for destroying cell membrane integrity? Polymyxenes and daptomycin, okay. Daptomycin is a lipopeptide that disrupts the cell membrane of gram positive by creating a transmembrane channel. Okay. Do you guys do you guys know that there are some questions which are a bit difficult and only 20% to 30% of, of the students can answer them? Yes. And that separates the best students from the good students, right? U.S. Assembly step one will have questionnaires who will make questions will daptomycin. And in the question stem, they will mention that they, the physician has prescribed a drug, the mechanism of which is by uh, creation of a transmembrane channel, which what is the name of the drug that has been prescribed? So they do not mention that daptomycin disrupts cell membrane integrity. What they mention is that they have prescribed the drug that creates a transmembrane channel. What is the name of the drug? So always remember this is I figured this out way later after solving a lot of questions in MBME uh, a couple of years back <clears throat> is that they would love to test you whether you know that that you they well to first and foremost daptomycin is not very commonly used in a clinical setting because it's um, this is not the first line of antibiotics this is used way later but it's very it's it's a favorite question for questionnaires because they would like to test you whether you would know that mechanism of action of daptomycin or not okay so transmembrane channel creators and that's how they disrupt the cell membranes they're used for staph aureus especially MARSA and VRE, okay? And they can cause myopathy and rhabdomyolysis. Uh, this is also high yield because this is very particular to daptomycin only. You won't find a lot of other drugs causing rhabdomyolysis because what comes with rhabdomyolysis is, what comes after rhabdomyolysis? What comes after rhabdomyolysis? What happens if you have rhabdomyolysis? Very good, renal failure hyperkalemia, you can have cardiac problems and you can have renal failure. Is it the same as Dapson? It's absolutely not the same as Dapson because Dapson is a sulfonamide. It's, it's similar to sulfonamides, 
Okay. Now, next one. Next one is. Okay, so I'm just gonna put two more stars over here for depth of icing. Okay. Next one. Next one is metronidazole. Metronidazole. Do you guys remember yesterday we also drew metro metronidazole, which uh, prevents DNA integrity by forming free radicals, right? So they form free radicals. And this is also a favorite question. What is the name of the drug that works by forming toxic free radicals in the bacteria that damage DNA? The answer is metronidazole. So questions are going to come from this side mostly, and the answer is the name of the drug. They are bac bactericidal and then also antiprotozole. So they're also used for GI dia and amoeba, trichomonas, gardenella, and Arabs and everything else. They're also there. And, and they're, all, they're sometimes also used in triple therapy. Okay, they're sometimes also used in triple therapy. Do we, do we, have, um, do we have Dr. Hassan with us today? Dr. Dr. Hassan, let me see. <clears throat> okay, okay. The reason I was looking for, okay. So, so the thing is, uh, certain countries, they use triple therapy where they prescribed um, where they prescribe metronidazole in place of amoxicillin. The reason being is, is that sometimes in some third world countries, metronidazole is actually cheaper to prescribe. So what, first and foremost, what are the three drugs for triple therapy? Fast, fast answers, please. What are the three drugs for triple therapy? Very good. Amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and PPI. Sometimes, sometimes some physicians, if they come across a patient in a third world country who is not financially stable, something which we do not have to worry about here in USA because everyone has Medicaid, <clears throat> then we would like to prescribe them and them metronidazole instead of amoxicillin. First of all, if the patient if the patient have penicillin allergy, that's also number one. And another one is metronidazole is also a cheaper drug to prescribe instead of amoxicillin, so that's that. And metronidazole can cause disulfiram-like reactions. Basically, if anyone is an alcoholic and you prescribe them metronidazole, this can cause sulfur disulfiram-like reactions. Disulfiram-like reactions, we use advantage of disulfiram-like reactions to induce these types of sign symptoms in a patient with alcohol so that they will stop drinking, okay? So it's used to prevent drinking in alcoholics. So metronidazole is also a disulfiram-like reaction causing drug with alcohol, which will result in flushing tachycardia, hypo hypotension, headache, and metallic taste. So that's that. Uh, flushing, tachycardia, and hypotension are the disulfiram like reactions. Headache and metallic taste are the extra side effects. Okay. So, do we have a proper idea about exactly what to study from metronidazole? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Good. Now, let's start talking about antimicrobacterial. Okay. So with that being said, we can uh, confirm. So with that being said, we can confirm that we are done with antibiotics except antimicrobacterials, okay? Has everyone understood antibiotics except antimicrobacterials? Okay, does anyone have any question? Please repeat. Which one do you want me to repeat, Dr. Kobasi? Daptomycin. Daptomycin, mechanism of action of daptomycin is basically daptomycin. Okay. So if this is a cell membrane of a bacteria, okay, if this is a cell membrane of a bacteria, if I create a channel over here, okay, if I create a channel over here, then then what, what would happen is this would cause osmotic damage and everything would leak out from the cytoplasm outside and this will damage the cell membrane integrity. So daptomycin, the way they work is they create a transmembrane channel. 
Have you understood now? Does anyone have any more question? Does anyone have any more question? Okay. If no one has any more question, then I would like to proceed to antimicrobacterial drugs. Can I proceed to antimicrobacterial drugs, guys? Okay, perfect. Now, let's start talking about antimicrobacterial drugs, okay? Antimicrobacterial drugs, before we learn about antimicrobacteria, first of all, let's learn about mycobacteria, okay? Mycobacteria, mycobacteria, um, there are some things which we have to learn about the plasma membrane and about the cell wall of um, mycobacteria, okay? So what I am going to do is I'm going to try my best to see if I can do that, okay? First of all, I'm going to, going to draw, draw the plasma membrane and then I'm going to draw the cell membrane over, uh, I mean the cell wall over here, <clears throat> okay? Now, okay, now the cell wall that I'm going to draw over here, first of all, this is the mycobacterial structure. Let's assume this is the structure of the mycobacteria, okay? Over here, what you obviously have is you have the cellular DNA, right? And then if this is the cellular DNA, you have then over here mycobacteria. Uh, you also have uh, you also have this enzyme over here, which is working effectively, which is the RNA polymerase, trying to prescribe, uh, trying to form the mRNAs, right? You have the RNA polymerase trying to form the mRNAs, and now. This layer outside, this layer is known as the phospholipid bilayer, right? This is the phospholipid bilayer plasma, mem plasma membrane with the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic portions. Okay, this is just a segment of how this looks. And now this is the outer cell wall. So the cell wall, let's talk about the layers of the cell wall. The first layer of the cell wall, okay? The first layer of the cell wall this, um, this green one that goes all the way like this, this is peptido, peptido glycan. okay? This is peptidoglycan. The next, the next layer of mycobacteria, okay? The next layer of mycobacteria is arabino. The next layer is Arabino. Galactane. Arabino galactane. Okay. That's the next layer. Then there is another layer over here. Okay, I'm just gonna draw a single line, but in reality, their their lines are thicker and thinner according to what it is. So the layer outside of arabinoglycane. This layer, this blue layer is known as mycolic, mycolic acid, okay? This is known as mycolic acid. Now, this purple layer over here, this purple layer is acyl lipids. Basically, complex lipids. That's what you, that's what we mean. Meaning that it's it has a it has an outer complex lipid layer. Okay. So the complexity of the cell wall is what we use to target different portions with different sorts of antimicrobacterials, and the, that this is the reason why I drew down this thing so that we can understand more easily. So once again, this is the structure of a mycobacteria. You have tuberculosis, you have mycobacterium lepri, you have mycobacterium avium, complex intracellulary. So all of these have these sorts of similar structures. They have a DNA, then they have phospholipid bilayer cell membrane, then they will have a thick cell wall consisting of green layer, peptidoglycan, purple layer, arabinogalactin, 
blue layer, mycolic acid, purple layer, acyl lipids. Okay, now different layers are going to be targeted by different sorts of uh, antimicrobacterials. Number one. Number one is let's start talking about, let's go from outwards, outwards to inwards. Okay, we'll go like this. We'll go like this. So the first outer layer over here is SI lipids, and SI lipids are not targeted very. They're not targeted because, uh, to be really honest, they're not a very integral part of the whole thing because the anti antimicrobacterial can easily penetrate through the SL lipids. So they're, they're actually there to maintain the integrity of the um, bacteria as a whole, but they're not a very protective um, layer of the bacteria. So SL lipids are not targeted by any antimicrobacterial, so that's that. Next one is let's start talking about mycolic acid, okay? Mycolic acid, the drug that targets mycolic acid is isoniazide, okay? The drug that targets mycolic acid is isoniazide. Now, next one, next one is, next one is arabinogalactane. Arabinogalactane, the drug that targets arabinogalactane, that drug is known as, does anyone know the name of this drug? The name of the drug is ethambutyl. Okay, do I have everyone's attention over here? Please try to put your attention because this is you learning the mechanism of action of the drug. Okay, this is you learning the mechanism of action of the drug because after when we read first aid, I will not put a lot of attention to the mechanism of action because this is the mechanism of action. For example, isoniazide, the mechanism of action is it inhibits mycolic acid synthesis. Ethambutyl, the mechanism, mechanism of action is it inhibits arabinogalactin synthesis. That's why blue for isoniazide for blue mycolic, purple for ethambutyl for purple arabinogalactin. Next one. <clears throat> next one, next one that I want to target and talk about is um, this one over here, okay, is this one over here. So this one is RNA polymerase. This one is targeted by rifampin. Rifampin, okay. This one is targeted by rifampin. And over here, <clears throat> this is a comparatively newer drug, okay, which was very recently, which was re very recently um, created in the last two decades, that is in the early 2000s. I mean, in the late, I mean, in uh, around 1990s to the early 2000s, this drug came into place. The mechanism of action of this drug is still not clear, but this, mechan but this drug works in the cellular cytoplasm of the mycobacteria. And the mechanism of action is pretty unclear, but um, they, this drug, first of all, let me tell you the name. The name of this drug is pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide. Okay. The, the theory is this pyrazinamide is converted to a very acidic component <clears throat> that is known as pyrazinoic acid. Pyrazinoic acid will that would accumulate in the cytoplasm, and this would um, this would uh, cause a this would cause an imbalance of the pH of the normal pH and this will disrupt all the intracellular enzymes and the mycobacteria and that's how this drug works. Having said that, this is just a theory. Okay, this has still not been tested. So for the purpose of step one, all you have to know is that the mechanism of action of pyrazinamide is that they work in the cytoplasm, okay, and they are unclear. The mechanism of action is unclear, okay? Okay, <clears throat> there's another drug which we failed to mention over here. This drug is, this is a protein structure and this is the ribosome. We have 50S, we have 30S, but for mycobacteria, we have to know only 30S. There's another drug which works exclusively on the 30S ribosomal subunit of the mycobacteria. This drug is known as <clears throat> streptomycin. Okay, this drug is known as streptomycin. Okay, so having said that, now we are done with all the mechanism of actions of all the antimicrobacterial drugs. We have isoniazide, which inhibits mycotic acid synthesis, ethambutyl, which inhibits arabinogalactin, rifampin, which inhibits RNA polymerase, pyrazinamide, which inhibits, uh, the mechanism is unclear, but it works in the cellular cytoplasm. Streptomycin, which inhibits 30S, ribosomal subunit. 
<laughs> okay, is everyone clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. All right, if you, um, okay. Now, mm, let's go over here. Let's start with a discussion from first day. Let's see where we stand. Okay, antimycobacterials. First of all, we are talking about treatment and prophylaxis. Prophylaxis, everyone remembers treatment. No one remembers prophylaxis. So we're going to pay a bit more attention to this one. That is mycobacterium tuberculosis. For example, for example, right now, if we have a physician who is planning to go and visit, um, for example, India or Bangladesh or any other third world country where tuberculosis is um, very, pre very prevalent, we will ask them to prophylax themselves with isoniazide to prevent infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then we would give them, if they do, however, get mycobacterium tuberculosis, then we will start the treatment with, with isoniazide rifampicin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Okay. Next one is mycobacterium avium intracellulari. Okay. This is prescribed more or less for AIDS patients who are immunocompromised, who have who are traveling to a mycobacterium endemic zone. So we will prescribe them isoniazide for tuberculosis and for intracellulary, we will prescribe them azithromycin and rifabutin. Rifabutin is more high yield than azithromycin. So rifabutin, I'm gonna put a box over here, put a star mark. And azithromycin and clarithromycin presithambutyl is given for the actual infection. Mycobacterium lepri, we know the treatment for lepri that is clofazimine, rifampin and dapsone. Right. So dapsone, rifampin for tuberculoid and for leprometus, we add clofazimine for all of them. So for leprometus, it's not only clofazimine, once again, it's clofazimine, dapsone and rifampin. And for tuberculoid, it's only dapsone and rifampin. Okay. Now, we're not going to go and discuss this diagram anymore because we discussed this over here. So let's talk about rifamycines. Rifamycines, once again, well, well, what is the mechanism of action of rifamycin? Fast answers, please. What is the mechanism of action of rifamycin? <clears throat> Inhibits RNA polymerase. Very good. So rifamycins, rif rifampin and rifabutin, they inhibit DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Okay. Can, that This is 80% of the knowledge of, rif of rifampin. Okay, clinical use is obviously they are used for mycobacterium tuberculosis, but sometimes they're also used for patient for prophylaxis of hemophilus influenza type B. And this, my friends, is another question. Okay, do you remember when we were studying hemophilus influenza, we said we prescribed rifampin for prophylaxis? Who remembers that? Right? Okay, good, very good. Adverse effect wise, minor hepatotoxicity is there. Another interesting side effect is, if you prescribe patients rifampin and you make them cry, you'll realize that their tears are orange colored. Okay, orange colored bodily fluids will be seen over there. And rifampin, uh, they cause drug interaction by increasing cytochrome P450, that's, so we'll skip this for now, we'll come back to this later. Rifabutin favored over rifampin in HIV, due to less CPV450 stimulation. The only thing you have to understand from over here is two things. Rifampin will cause hepatotoxicity and orange color body fluid. CP450 and all of these things will be mastered later. So let's not focus on this one. Let's focus on the thing that I actually ask you to focus on. That is hepatotoxicity and orange body fluids. Mechanism of resistance. Obviously, if this drug is responsible for binding to, to RNA polymerase, if there's a mutation in RNA polymerase, will this drug work properly? Yes or no? No. So of course this is high yield. Another one is, if you prescribe a patient only rifampin and not isoniazide, we are well aware as physicians by now that that would cause, that, that would cause antibiotic resistance, am I correct? Yes or no? Yes, okay, we all know this. We all know this, right? So R for all the rifampin. I personally did not use this mnemonic, so you, I, I'm not gonna ask you to do it. So we can move on. Next one is isoniazide. 
Isonazide, mechanism of action of isonazide, please. Where does isonazide work? Where does isonazide work? Mechanism of action of isonazide, inhibition of mycolic acid synthesis. Okay, it's a bacterial catalase superoxidase ox needed to convert isonazide to active metabolite. Basically, isonazide, when it is prescribed, it's prescribed more or less as a prodrug. This has to be converted into an active compound. And the enzyme CAPG, catalase peroxidase, this enzyme is responsible for conversion of isonazide to an active metabolite. The clinical use is it's used for mycobacterium tuberculosis, the only agent used for solo prophylaxis, meaning that we can prescribe this as a solo prophylaxis. And also sometimes in latent tuberculosis, we can give them as a monotherapy. Only isonazide can be prescribed as a monotherapy. Does that mean if not work in cat negative? Yes, we, we, we will come to that in one second. Okay, we will come to that in one second. Let's focus on this one for, for now. Adverse effect wise, adverse effect wise, once again, always remember, okay, I want you guys to remember one thing. Anti-tubercular drugs hate your liver. Anti-tubercular drugs will hate your liver. They will destroy everything in your liver. So anti-tubercular drugs will always cause hepatotoxicity. They will cause CPE for, they're also CP450 inhibitors and they can cause drug-induced SLE. Anion gap, metabolic acidosis there, vitamin B6 deficiency is also there. So patients of isonazide, they can get peripheral neuropathy and sideroblastic anemia because of pyridoxine deficiency. Okay, so whenever you give your patients isonazide, you have to prescribe pyridoxine. They can cause vitamin B6 deficiency. This is extremely high yield. Do not prescribe your patients isonazide without vitamin B6 because when we try to break down isonazide into metabolites to get rid of the isonazides from the body, vitamin B6 is used up in the process. And this causes severe vitamin B6 deficiency. Can, can anyone tell me why we get peripheral neuropathy in B6 deficiency? Why is there peripheral neuropathy in B6 deficiency? Anyone? You know, we get peripheral neuropathies for B12s. We get peripheral neuropathy for folic acid. Why do we get peripheral neuropathy for B6 deficiency? Either you know or you don't know, please provide a, an answer, yes or no. Does anyone have any idea? No problem. So thank you for trying. Basically, B6 deficiency, vitamin B6 deficiency, Dr. Adenom is right. First of all, it's, it's responsible for synthesis of niacin. That's number one. Another one is vitamin B6 have, uh, if there is deficiency, this also hampers the, this also hampers the neurotransmitters, synthesis of all the neurotransmitters. So basically what you have is you have, mus you have uh, neuromuscular stimulation but you do not have release of neurotransmitter from the synapse in, into the synapses. As a result, you have peripheral neuropathy. So that's that. Okay, we don't want to get into the discussion of peripheral neuropathy and vitamin B6 deficiency. This is not high yield. I just wanted to see if you guys remember vitamin B6 as a whole or not. Okay, but I guess you guys do. So thank you. Next one. Next one is, and let, let's go back to the question asked by Dr. Iman, who asked that, so can isonazide work? If there is a patient who does not have proper catalase peroxidase, and the answer, Dr. Iman, is no, because if there is underexpression of catalase peroxidase or CAT-G, then isonazide will not be converted to an active component, and they cannot exert their mechanism of action. So mechanism of resistance, once again, rifampin was RNA polymerase mutation, and isonazide is mutations leading to underexpression of CAT-G. Okay. Are we clear? Can we move on to pyrazinamide? Okay, pyrazinamide. 
Mechanism of action of pyrazinamide is uncertain. Pyrazinamide is a prodrug that is converted to active compound. If you can remember that pyrazinamide works in the cytoplasm, that's more than enough. Pyrazinamide, an adverse effect wise, hepatotoxic is there because antitubercular drugs hate your liver, that's there. And another one is they can cause hyperuricemia. Okay, that's, this is the only thing you have to know from pyrazinamide that they cause hyperuricemia. Ethambutol. Ethambutol is responsible for arabinogalactane synthesis. So they decrease carbohydrate polymerase of mycobacterium cell wall by blocking this enzyme, arabinosyl transferase. Arabinosyl transferase is responsible for the proper synthesis of arabinogalactane. And as a result, there is a weakness in the cell wall and um, the mycobacteria dies away. The adverse effects are hepatotoxicity is there, but this causes retrobulbar optic neuropathy. That is retrobulbar, meaning that this causes posterior to the bulbar portion of the optic region. It causes neuropathy for which you see red, green color blindness and it's usually reversible, okay? So the reason why ethambutol, ethambutol and questions from ethambutol are famous for two reasons. First of all, the mechanism of action, of course, that is arabinosyl transferase inhibition and arabinogalactane synthesis, that's there. Another one is they cause optic neuropathy. Okay, that's there. Now, streptomycin. Streptomycin, we said that they interfere with 30S component of the ribosome and the clinical use is they are used for mycobacterium tuberculosis as a second line, not as the first line. First of all, we always prescribe isonides and rifampin and then we prescribe all the other drugs, okay? Adverse effect wise, they can cause tinnitus, vertigo, ataxia, and nephrotoxicity. Over here, the only thing that you have to remember is tinnitus. Okay, tinnitus. For your fast revision and recapitulation only. I mean, not the only thing. You, all, you also have to remember the mechanism of action, that is 30S. So these two things 30S and tinnitus. Okay. Are we clear? Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Why is it confusing? Erythromycin is a macrolid right? And streptomycin also is a sort of macrolid. Azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, streptomycin. Yes, it's also a macrolid. They work at the 30S component of the ribosome. So that's why they inhibit both endomycin but different family. Just try to remember that they work at 30S and that should be okay. okay. That's enough. So can we if you can remember septomycin works at 30 s like the macrolids, then that should be enough. Okay. Now, can we begin with antimicrobial prophylaxis? Yes or no? Okay, now let's begin with antimicrobial prophylaxis. Okay. Are you guys uh, enjoying today's lecture or is it boring or have you guys reached a plateau because we have learned a lot of things? Or is there anything that you guys would like to share? Do you... You guys are not tired or something, are you? Are you guys tired? Okay. Macrolids, erythromycin, step, um, uh, azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, macrolids, 
they work at the 50S ribosomal subunit and streptomycin work at 30S. Yes, they're different family, but just try to remember ACE. ACE macrolids are ACE. Okay, there's no other there is no other mycin outside of ACE. Azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, they work at 50S. And um, your streptomycin works at 30S. Okay, are we clear? This is how you can avoid confusion. No. Let's start talking about my antimicrobial prophylaxis. Antimicrobial prophylaxis, uh, as a physician, okay, as a physician, is it not better for you to prevent a disease than cure a disease? Yes, all the physicians. Is it not better for you to prevent the disease before you cure a disease? So if you have to prevent a disease and if your patient is telling you that, yes, I'm going to this place or that place, and you know that that place is filled with Nigeria meningo, Nigeria meningitis, then the patients are at high risk for having meningococcal, or the patients are at high risk of having malaria, or the patients are at high risk of having tuberculosis. So you have to know exactly what sort of drug you have to prescribe to your patient so that they don't have these infections. So if there's a patient who has uh, who has the potential of being exposed to meningococcal infections, okay, to meningococcal infection. It's very easy. Meningococcal infections are basically you have to give them ceftriaxone and another one is rifampin. These are the two high yield drugs which you have to give them. Ceftriaxone and rifampin, meningococcal disease. If there is a patient who has a risk for, um, who, for example, is going through a dental procedure and uh, they have a pre previously damaged valve, they had a valve repair, and this patient has dental caries, and there's a there's a um, there's a risk of having endocarditis from from the viridens, right? So before you start the procedure, you can prescribe them amoxicillin. Okay, next one. Next one is, of, of course, if you have a patient who has UTIs, you should always prescribe them. Trimethoprim, sulfamethoprim, dihydrofolate, dihydroupgrade synthase inhibitors. Now, what, what was the name of the drug that we prescribed for malaria prophylaxis and for how long did we prescribe the drug? Fast access, please, number one. Very good. Mefloquine. We did not prescribe it for four weeks. We prescribed the mefloquine for one month plus another four more weeks after the patient comes back from the endemic zone to prevent the liver skid zones from being activated and causing the disease. So mefloquine. Along with mefloquine, we can also provide atovacone and proguanil, but mefloquine is number one. Next one. Next one is, do you guys remember we talked about, do you guys remember that physio video where we saw that pregnant woman in front of a glacier, Streptococcus agalexia, and we said that um, if we we'll that we will always screen a, a, a pregnant pregnant woman for Streptococcus agalexia at the 37 to 38 weeks of pregnancy. Yes or no? Do you guys remember that that one, right? So, what do we give the, those women, those pregnant mothers who have agalexia infections? at the 37 to 38 weeks of pregnancy. What do we give them? We give them intrapartum penicillin or ampicillin. Okay, very good. If you have a patient who has, for example, the mother has gonorrhea and the patient has ophthalmia neon, neon, neonatorum, ophthalmia, and you want to prevent ophthalmia neonatorum. Okay, what are you going to give as an ointment? Do you remember? Erythromycin ointment, very good. Okay, absolutely amazing. Thank you for your fast answers. Erythromycin ointments, okay. 
Do you guys remember what we just read about cephalosporin first generation? Can anyone tell me the name of the first generation cephalosporins? Cephazolin and Lexine. Do you guys remember we, we said that we give first generation for post-surgical patients to prevent, to prevent staph infections? Yes or no? Right, so staph infections. We give them cephazolin. Next one. Next one is if you have a patient with streptococcal pharyngitis, okay, if you have a patient with streptococcal pharyngitis, what are we going to prescribe them to prevent, let's say, rheumatic fever? Anyone? Streptococcal pharyngitis. What is the treatment for streptococcal pharyngitis? Penicillin? Yes, the answer is absolutely correct. The answer is? Penicillin. Now, which penicillin do we give? Do we give the gangster penicillin or do we give the easy soft core penicillin? Okay. Why is penicillin G called gangster penicillin? Why why is it called, called, called uh, gangster penicillin? It's not a called a gangster penicillin because it's long acting. It's called a gangster because gangsters are not, not afraid to receive injections intravenous and intramuscular. So penicillin G is a gangster, okay? Intravascular and intramuscular, meaning that they are not afraid to receive injections. Penicillin G is administered IV or IM. Penicillin V is administered oral. <clears throat> so that's that. Hopefully the, with that, you have everything that's covered over here. So if you guys need, okay. Now, can I give you guys two minutes? No, I'll give you guys one minute, but didn't also remain for a long time in the body. Yes, they also remain in the long time in the body. Now, I'll give you guys one minute, go through this. I'll ask you questions after you guys tell me the names of the medications and the clinical scenario in which we prescribe them, then we'll move forward, okay? How long do you guys need? Do you guys need one minute or two minutes? Two minutes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, is everyone ready? Twenty seconds, okay.
Yeah, okay, Dr. Hussam is ready. Is, there, is, there, is anyone else ready? Can we begin? Okay, good, very good. Now, uh, first one is meningococcal infections. What do we prescribe to patients? Meningococcal infections, what do we prescribe? Very good. Rifampins have cracked. The next one, endocarditis patients with a history of uh, dental caries. Very good. Next one is if you want to prevent UTIs, what do we, what do we prescribe? TMPSMX. Next one is if we want to prevent um, uh, streptococcus agalexi infection from the mother to the young baby, what do we prescribe? If we want to pre prevent ophthalmia neonatorum, what do we prescribe? If we want to prevent post-surgical infection due to staph aureus, what do we prescribe? Okay. If we want to prevent streptococcal pharyngitis, what do we prescribe? Okay, good. Now, are we ready to move on? Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys can, can uh, tell me this. First of all, um, is if the CD4 count of the patients are less than 200, what are the organisms that can cause infections in these patients? HHJB, very good. With that, I'm pretty sure there's histoplasma, HHV, HIV, all right? Pneumocystis and John Cunningham. Okay. And so basically, if we want to prevent pneumonia in patients of HIV, can we expect the CD4 count to be 200 or less at all times? Yes, okay. So, the pneumonia that I want to talk about is which pneumonia is more prevalent in patients with CD4 count 200 or less? Pneumocystis pneumonia. And the um, medication we prescribe for pneumocystis, with pneumocystis pneumonia is the same medication we prescribe to prevent recurrent UTIs. What is the name of this medication? TMP SMX. Okay, we prescribe TMP SMX. And, okay, so we prescribe TMP SMX. And if the CD4 count is less than 50, then we have another problem because we can get AVM complex for which we would prescribe azithromycin or clarithromycin. This is not very high yield. This is, this is more high yield than this, okay? The next one is treatment of high resistant bacteria. Now you have methicillin resistant staph aureus, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, and multiple drug resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa. For MARSA, the first line is vancomycin always. If the patients have um, already, they are having niacin or any other sort of thing, for, such as they're high in serotonin, we can give them daptomycin. Okay. For vancomycin resistant, we can give linozolid or streptogamines, these are the two. So just keep on, keep your focus on the ones which I am trying to focus you on and that, that should be enough. You should, you do not have to do, remember all the end, all the names. MARSA for vancomycin, daptomycin, VRE for linozolid and streptogamines. Multiple drug resist, resistant pseudomonas originosa is polymyxines, okay? B and E, are we clear? <laughs> polymyxines, B and polymyxines. E. 
vancomycin resistant enterococci. Okay. Vancomycin resistant enterococci. So that's that. Okay. So with that, we are done with antibiotics. Now, with antifungal therapy, uh, we have to put in a way more attention. So do you guys want to do it today or should we do it tomorrow? Because tomorrow we would be done with microbiology for sure. And then tomorrow we can also begin with pathology. Ooh. Tomorrow, okay. So in the meantime, um, since we are not doing a lot of questions and um, we are also not doing you world notes, okay? So we can successfully say that we are done with the you world notes, at least for the first batch of students who have received the you world notes. Um, we, ha we, are, we have completed the UWorld notes with you all. And with the students who have not received the UWorld notes as of yet, that's because we, have, we will start the UWorld notes once again when we begin cardiovascular system very soon. And that's the second batch of, um, that's the second batch of Dr. Hattie step one. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so, so with that being said, can, can we stop with the first aid over here for today? Yes, okay, okay, all right. So let's stop with the first aid over here for today. Uh, I'm not gonna do any more questions today. The reason being is because I need to give you guys some time to read um, all the drugs, okay? You have to read all the drugs you just read because we didn't master it, okay? Did we master the pharma? Yes or no? We did not master the pharma, did we? Did we master antibiotics? Do you remember previously when we would try to master something, we would try to make sure we memorized it right away. But since the information is so much, we could not master it, but we know exactly what we have to read and we have a very basic idea. So out of 100%, how much would you say your confidence level is with antibiotics? Is it 50% or more? Fifty percent or more with antibiotics. Sixty to seventy percent. Okay, so the rest of the confidence should be back when you read it again. So I need you guys. What I need you guys to do is, since we are ending the lectures a bit early nowadays, the reason is because I'm I'm trying to give you guys time with microbiology, so that you guys can use some extra time to read and uh, learn the drugs and the bugs. Okay. So that's the thing. So with that being said, I would love to end the lecture here for today, hoping that you guys would be starting to study the drugs which we have just discussed, okay? Do you guys promise to start studying the drugs? Okay, I know I know a lot of you are not doing the homeworks properly, but please, I, I insist you guys to do the homeworks, please. Okay, go through the things, go through the drugs, go through the information which we have, which we have asked you to write down because if you guys don't, then you guys will forget it very soon, okay? So with that being said, thank you so much for staying with us, okay? I hope you guys have a very good day. If you guys have any questions, send us an email and hopefully we'll start the lecture early tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you and have a great day, bye-bye.